hearing is being webcast and recorded. So when you speak, please say your name clearly into your phone or your microphone on your computer. There will be uh, no, there will not be sworn testimony and we will have a staff presentation followed by panel presentations and then uh, public comment. Uh, after the staff presentation, the three presentations uh, that we will hear from, from uh, panelists and stakeholders. Uh, the first will be from uh, tribal representatives, uh, followed by environmental group representatives, and then mining representatives. Uh, each panel will be allowed about 30 minutes. Once we move on to public speaker cards, I will call speakers in the order that we have received your virtual speaker card. As always, I'll do my best to allow public officials and representatives of organizations uh, to speak first. When I call your name, the clerk will unmute your microphone. Uh, then please again, state your name slowly and identify the organization that you represent, if any. Uh, time limits uh, may be imposed on oral comments if necessary to allow all participants the opportunity to be heard. Also, as a result of the COVID-19 emergency, we're conducting today's public hearing, as you can see via video and teleconference. In order to comply with the public gathering limit limitations and physical distancing requirements, and as authorized by the governor's executive orders. So there is no physical meeting room that we are meeting in today. For people only wanting to listen or watch the meeting, the board's customary webcast is available. If you're wanting to provide public comment and uh, we are then receiving presentations of public comment through uh, the Zoom meeting platform. So if you intend to make public comment or you think you might be interested in commenting, you should already be here in the Zoom meeting with us uh, using the personal ID provided to you when you registered if you have not registered, please open the agenda and click on the link for the remote meeting and scroll to the bottom of the page where the link under speaker uh, requesting to speak is. If you need assistance, uh, just email the clerk of the board at commentletters at waterboards.ca.gov and she will be able to help you as soon as she's available here. For those in the Zoom meeting, uh, you will be on mute and your camera is turned off until it is your turn to speak. The clerk uh, will then unmute you and ask you to turn on your camera if you have one. Uh, when you're done speaking and the board members have completed asking questions, uh, you will be placed on mute and your camera turned off. Uh, and with that, I think we uh, are prepared to, to go to uh, the staff presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Billy, I don't see the presentation on. It may uh, be a moment here as Janine um, pulls it up for a second. Good morning, Chair Escoval and board members. My name is Afruz Farsi Madan. I am the NPDES wastewater program manager in the Division of Water Quality. My colleagues and I are here today to present to you a summary of the proposed statewide NPDES permit for suction dredge mining discharges. Next slide, please. Other staff with me today is Renan Haragi, the lead permit writer drafting the proposed permit. Diana Messina, Surface Water Permitting Section Chief, Phil Crater, Division of Water Quality Assistant Deputy Director, and the Office of Chief Counsel Attorney Ryan Mallory Jones. I will present the first few slides, giving you an overview of the development of the draft permit, and Renan will continue the presentation, providing a summary of the proposed permit. Next slide, please. The State Water Board released the draft suction dredge mining permit for a 45-day public comment period on May 12, 2020. Staff held a remote public workshop on May 28. The board hearing was initially scheduled for June 17, and the 45-day public comment period was to end on June 29. During and after the May 28 public workshop, we received requests to postpone the board hearing date to allow time for interested parties to comment. We rescheduled the board hearing date to today and extend, extended the public comments due date to August 24. The release date of the final draft permit addressing public comments and the date for board 
board consideration of the final draft is to be determined. Next slide, please. There has been a legislative moratorium on suction dredge mining since 2009. Senate Bill 637 became effective on January 1, 2016. Senate Bill 637 expands suction dredge mining definition to add additional types of suction dredge mining activities requires miners to obtain a water board's permit or a letter indicating no permit is needed and a Department of Fish and Wildlife permit before they can start suction dredge mining. Senate Bill 637 requires the Department of Fish and Wildlife to revise its regulations. Next slide, please. There are several potential water quality concerns associated with suction dredge mining activities due to the streambed disturbance caused by this activity. One concern is the release of bound mercury and trace metals resulting in the increased levels of mercury, trace metals, and toxicity levels in the water body. Other potential impacts include increased turbidity, mobilization of sediment containing metal mercury to downstream water bodies, formation of metal mercury in downstream water bodies, bioaccumulation of metal mercury in aquatic organisms and fish tissue, and physical disturbances to the water body bed and banks impacting water uh, aquatic life. Next slide, please. This slide lists potentially impacted beneficial uses due to suction dredge mining activities. These are existing beneficial uses in the regional water board's basin plants. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the extensive public outreach effort conducted during the development of this proposed permit. In 2017, State Water Board staff conducted five public outreach workshops throughout the state in San Bernardino, Fresno, Sacramento, Reading, and Orleans to provide basic regulatory information related to Senate Bill 637 requirements and listen to initial feedback. In 2017 to 2018, staff posted general permitting related information and a frequently asked questions document on the State Water Board Suction Dredge Mining webpage to continue providing basic regulatory information. Staff continued on through 2019, holding focused meetings to discuss proposed regulation of suction dredge mining with an NPDES permit. Staff continued into 2020 with focused meetings. On May 28th of this year, during the current public comment period, staff held an online informational public workshop to explain the content of the draft permit and answer questions. These discussions were with Native American tribal representatives, individual miners and mining association representatives, legislative staff, non-governmental organizations, the Department of Fish and Wildlife staff, the U.S. Forest Service staff, and other interested parties and agencies. Next slide, please. Staff held regular meetings with the Department of Fish and Wildlife staff to coordinate the suction dredge mining permitting. During these meetings, the State Water Board staff discussed the proposed permitting approach and schedule and obtained spatial information to map the Department of Fish and Wildlife year-round prohibitions. The Department of Fish and Wildlife staff provided information on the department's existing suction dredge mining regulation, described the department's effort to implement Senate Bill 637, 
in the context of the existing statutory moratorium and discuss coordination between the water boards and the Department of Fish and Wildlife Permitting and Compliance Evaluation per Senate Bill 637. Next slide, please. Currently, the Fish and Game Code prohibits unpermitted suction dredge mining. The Fish and Game Code defines suction dredge mining as the use of vacuum or suction dredge equipment, also known as suction dredging, the use of a mechanized or motorized system for removing or assisting in the removal of or the processing of material from the bed, bank, or channel of a river, stream, or lake in order to recover minerals. The proposed suction dredge mining permit is a statewide general permit. General permits regulate common types of discharges that have common types of water quality impacts. The proposed permit covers in-water suction dredge mining activities only and defines this activity as motorized dredge mining activities that take place in a water body, utilize a single intake nozzle, and that directly discharge to surface waters. Other forms of suction dredge mining activities are site-specific and cannot be regulated under a statewide general permit. Next slide, please. Other types of suction dredge mining activities, such as high banking, dry washing, and mechanized gold panning are not covered under the proposed permit. Miners need to work with regional water board staff for site specific consideration. The regional water boards may consider issuing an NPDES permit, waste discharge requirements, or a letter indicating that no permit is needed. The moratorium on suction dredge mining activities not covered under the proposed permit will continue until those activities are allowed by the state. Believe me, we're having technical difficulties. You're back. Sorry, we uh, we lost you for a moment. Um, I'm uh, I have completed my presentation. Will Renan will take over now and go over the summary of the proposed permit. Great, thank you. Thank you, Fruz. Good morning, board chair and members. My name is Renan Hauri, a staff engineer in the NPDES unit, Division of Water Quality. I will now provide a summary of what's being proposed with this draft permit. First, this permit provides regulatory coverage for one type of activity only, as Afruz already mentioned. A typical in-water suction dredge mining activity where the material process comes from the water body and the discharge goes back to the same water body. Equipment used in a typical in-water suction dredge mining activity consists of a water pump, an engine, as loose box, which are typically mounted on pontoons and floated in the water body. The pump and suction hose are used to dredge material from either the bed or banks of the water body, which is then run over this loose box where most heavy materials settle and are caught. The water and remaining fine materials are then discharged from the sluice box back into the water body. Second, the proposed permit also includes various prohibitions of suction dredge mining in specified watersheds established to protect water quality from the potential impacts associated with suction dredge mining and based on specific studies, which I will discuss later in more detail. Third, for protection of tribal subsistence fishing and Native American culture beneficial uses, the proposed permit also requires a 30-day advance notification to Native American tribal representatives before commencing with any suction dredge mining, and I will discuss this more in the next slide. Fourth, the proposed permit also requires implementation of best management practices to minimize any water quality impacts. The best management practices cover five main areas, 
site management, operation, fuels and fueling, metals toxicity reduction, and erosion control. Fifth, with regards to monitoring, the proposed permit only requires visual monitoring in place of analytical water quality sampling because it is not feasible for miners to conduct proper sampling and getting to a lab in a timely manner, since most of these mining areas are in remote areas. In addition, the visual monitoring for turbidity is intended to be used as an indicator of proper implementation of best management practices. Sixth, the proposed permit at this time is proposing a one-time permit application fee, which will be applicable for the life of the permit, which is five years and no annual fee. The fee amount is the same as any other general NPDES permit. However, the reason for proposing no annual fee is because there would be years when the permit may not be utilized since under the Department of Fish and Wildlife regulations, a suction dredge mining permit would be issued annually and to a limited number of miners. And there may be years when a miner may not get a permit from the department. Keep in mind, this fee is just in a proposal at this time. In order to be in effect, the Water Board will need to approve this approach specific to suction dredge mining at a future board meeting when it adopts a new fee schedule. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, the proposed permit requires a tribal notification before any mining can begin. Miners are required to submit annually by email an advance notification to tribal representatives and the water boards at minimum 30 days prior to starting any mining activities in the proposed allowed areas for mining. The notification is to include the locations and dates of the proposed in-water suction dredge mining activities for the year. Miners then shall receive written confirmation from tribal representatives that the locations and dates either conflict or do not conflict with any tribal activities or concerns. If no response is received within the 30 days of notification, then mining activities may begin. Next slide, please. Now I will go into the specific prohibitions in the proposed permit. These prohibitions have water quality rationales, which are described in the fact sheet of the permit and were based on scientific studies and protection of water quality. The following discharges are prohibited. Discharges into watersheds with water bodies listed on the Clean Water Act, Section 303D as impaired for toxic metals, which include cadmium, chromium, copper, lead, mercury, nickel, silver and zinc, as well as methyl mercury. These water bodies that do not meet water quality objectives intended to protect aquatic life or human health. So any discharge of the listed metals will add to the impairment. Since a study performed in 1997 and 1998 confirmed that suction dredge mining activities caused increases on the levels of the salt metals in the water column and the discharges cannot feasibly be treated to remove the metals. This permit prohibits activity in these water bodies. The next prohibition relates to watersheds that contain water bodies with detected concentrations of mercury above a fish tissue water quality objective. Because suction dredge mining activities cause the resuspension of material, including mercury and methyl mercury, and because studies have confirmed that methyl mercury has been found to actually form in very fine sediment, allowing discharges from suction dredge mining activities in water bodies containing mercury and methyl mercury concentrations above the fish tissue water quality objectives with accelerated mobilization of mercury and bioaccumulation of methyl mercury to downstream water bodies. With caution to minimize further water quality impairment associated with bioaccumulation of mercury, the proposed permit prohibits suction dredge mining in watersheds with water bodies where mercury is detected above a fish tissue water quality objective. The next prohibition is for watersheds that contain water bodies located in areas of historic gold mining. Because a study found extremely high mercury concentrations in the water and sediment and demonstrated a positive correlation between mercury bioaccumulation and the intensity of historic hydraulic gold mining in the Dutch flat mining district, this permit on a conservative approach and without other site-specific studies that demonstrate otherwise, is prohibiting suction dredge mining in these areas because it is expected that there are high mercury levels that can cause additional mercury by accumulation impacts where there were historical mines. 
The next prohibition is related to water bodies subject to the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board Basin Plan Point Source Prohibition. This is an established prohibition in an adopted basin plan applicable to the North Coast Regional Board. This permit is implementing such prohibition. The last prohibition is related to water bodies with year-round Department of Fish and Wildlife prohibitions. These water bodies have already been established for the department's regulations as being prohibited all year round. This permit is implementing such prohibition. Next slide, please. With regards to the North Coast Regional Board Basin Plan Point Source Prohibition, I wanted to add that this is an already applicable prohibition that applies to all watersheds within the Klamath River Basin and the North Coastal Basin under the North Coast Regional Board jurisdiction, with some few water bodies being exempt. However, in reality, this prohibition only incorporates 15 additional watersheds since the majority of the watersheds within the North Coast Regional Board boundaries are already proposed to be prohibited under the other proposed prohibitions. Next slide, please. With regards to the proposed prohibition based on fish tissue exceedance, I want to add and clarify that this applies to water bodies with some data indicating mercury was detected above the fish tissue water quality objective. However, water bodies with fish tissue mercury detection not above the water quality objective were not included. Additional data will be necessary to confirm if such water bodies indeed meet the mercury fish tissue objective or may need to be listed as impaired. Next slide, please. With regards to the data and studies considered, in the case of the water bodies impaired for metals and mercury, the data used came from the US EPA approved 2014-2016 integrated report. And the study was a study performed in 1997 and 1998 to assess the possible impacts of suction dredge mining on water quality, benthic habitat, and biota in the 40 Mile River, Resurrection Creek, and Chattanooga River in Alaska. This study indicated that levels of dissolved trace metals, specifically copper and zinc, downstream of the suction dredge mining activity were greater than the upstream levels. This study confirmed that suction dredge mining activities caused sediment bound metals to be released in dissolved form into the water column, increasing the dissolved metals concentrations in the water body. So allowing it in an impaired water body would only add to the impairment. In the case of the water bodies with exceedance of fish tissue objective, the data used also came from the US EPA approved 2014-2016 integrated report, but also used more recent data as recent as early 2019 from the California Environmental Data Exchange Network. In this case, the study considered was a study conducted by the United States Geological Survey during 2011 and 2012, which collected environmental mercury data to analyze the factors that control mercury concentrations in fish tissue in the Sierra Nevada foothills. The United States Geological Survey collected water, sediment, and fish tissue samples from 24 locations. The study identified two main points regarding mercury and sediment. High levels, the first point is high levels of mercury are found in the very fine sediments or suspended particulates. And the second point, there's a higher ratio of monomethyl mercury to total mercury in the very fine suspended sediment. This report provides evidence that methyl mercury is already forming in the Sierra Nevada streams and can be found in the extremely fine sediment. And any disturbance caused by suction dredge mining activities has the potential to make mercury and methyl mercury available in the water column and in the fine suspended material and mobilize the sediment bound mercury to downstream water bodies. Next slide, please. In the case of water bodies subject to the Department of Fish and Wildlife year-round suction dredge mining prohibition, the department shared their spatial data for the year-round prohibitions that they had already developed. There is no applicable study to consider in this case as this prohibition is already under established regulations. In the case of water bodies near historic gold mines, for this prohibition, data was pulled from the Mineral Resources Data System. The data set for California was downloaded and points were selected as producer. For this case, it was another study conducted by the United States Geological Survey in 1999 under the name of Mercury Contamination 
from hydraulic glass or gold mining in the Dutch Flat Mining District, California. The study found extremely high mercury concentrations in the water and sediment, demonstrating a positive correlation between the intensity of historic hydraulic gold mining and the degree of mercury bioaccumulation on a watershed scale. Next slide, please. With regards to compliance, monitoring, reporting, and enforcement, this permit proposes the following. As already mentioned, a visual monitoring requirement instead of analytical sampling. Visual monitoring for turbidity to serve as an indicator of proper implementation of base management practices. For reporting, the permit requires the submittal of an annual report describing all the specific locations and dates where suction dredge mining took place, including pictures to demonstrate compliance. For compliance as needed, in-field compliance evaluation to be conducted with the aid of the Department of Fish and Wildlife and followed up by the regional boards. Since only requiring visual monitoring, the staff proposes portion of the permit fees to be considered for using a surface water ambient monitoring program and a regional monitoring so that proper data can be collected to better assess actual site-specific water quality impacts in any of the approved watershed locations and ensure permit requirements are protective of water quality. Next slide. Now here's the map of the proposed prohibited areas. This is still just a conceptual map and it's basically a visual representation of the prohibitions already mentioned. Each of the color represents a layer for a prohibition. This map was created using a geographical information system that used the data also mentioned earlier. We understand the maps in the permit are not of high resolution. However, if this concept is approved, the maps will be developed at a much higher resolution. Something to note here is that the North Coast Regional Board Basin Plan point source prohibition is not reflected on this conceptual map. Staff needs to further capture the specific water bodies applicable to this basin plan prohibition and capture those watersheds in a future higher resolution map. A further detailed map will also identify the water bodies in which the North Coast Regional Board prohibitions are seasonal. As previously mentioned, the North Coast Water Board Basin Plan Prohibition applies to many of the watersheds already identified in the other proposed prohibitions. Therefore, this map provides a general idea of the cumulative watersheds due to the combined proposed prohibitions. What happened to the presentation? There. Sorry, we had a technical difficulty there. Uh, okay, next slide. I wanted to add too that all the watersheds that you see on both maps are of hydrological unit code 10. And this is the scale under the United States Geological Survey hierarchical Back. system defining a watershed. So here is the other map. It's still a conceptual map as well, which provides the general areas in which suction dredge mining is proposed to be allowed. This completes the staff presentation. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Renan. <clears throat> um, any questions from fellow board members at this point? I remind everyone it is a workshop and so mainly here to listen, to be informed. And so uh, with that, we can move on to the uh, three panels. Um, Janine, I believe, First panelists we have up. Yes, the first panel is Craig Tucker. Mr. Tucker, I believe. Uh, yes, we have a PowerPoint too. Hi, it's Craig Tucker with the Krug Tribe. Can I just do a sound check to make sure you can hear me, Chairman? Yep. We can hear you mm -hmm. fine, Craig. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for uh, members of the board, uh, all the staff. I appreciate you guys uh, putting all the work uh, into this effort and inviting us to participate. And I uh, 
I feel a lot of pressure being a, a, a panel all by myself, but I, I, I'm up for the task. I just want to go through and maybe just take up about 10 minutes of your time to talk a little bit about how this activity affects the Krug tribe. And I think um, it's fair to say there are a lot of tribes in California that feel similarly. And then I, I kind of want to focus on some of the history that got us here because <clears throat> this battle has been going on a long time over how to properly regulate this activity. And I just want to make sure that um, all the staff and all the board members are familiar with it. So next slide, please. Or do I? There we go. I just want to orient folks. The Karuk tribe's Aboriginal territory is along the middle Klamath River. This is in far northern California, uh, almost to the Oregon border. Next slide, please. And uh, I can say for Karuk, and one of the things that is such a pleasure uh, being a non-native person working for Karuk is how many of Karuk's traditional practices are still implemented today and, and how their fishing strategies really haven't changed in, in thousands of years. Um, their basketry, their language, their art. Um, Karuk, like a lot of California tribes, remain really uh, what I would describe as culturally intact. And the Karuk were never relocated from their place. They've lived in the same place, dip netted the same falls, literally for thousands and thousands of years. Next slide, please. There's a lot going on. Uh, this is not unique to the Klamath, I would say, but the Klamath um, has, maybe the Klamath does have a unique amount of diversity relative to some of California's watersheds. We have multiple runs of salmon, multiple runs of steelhead, uh, multiple species of suckers. We have spawning populations of green sturgeon. We have lamprey, uh, several varieties of mussels uh, in the Klamath River and all of these or foods, uh, subsistence foods for, for native people. Next slide, please. But unfortunately, these fish are in trouble. Uh, pink salmon, chum salmon, candlefish have already been extirpated from the Klamath. We know uh, spring chinook have been petitioned for listing. Coho are listed on the federal and state endangered species list. Uh, summer steelhead are a species of special concern, as are green sturgeon. So, and in recent years, our fall chinook, which is really the workhorse of the tribal subsistence fishery, as well as our California's commercial offshore fishery, um, we're, we're seeing really meager returns of those fish, resulting in fishing closures for tribe sportsmen and commercial fishermen. Next slide. Loss of these food sources have a, a lot of impacts to the Karuk and other cultures. Um, if you think about it, it you, you really can't have a first salmon ceremony if there's no spring salmon. You, you have to have the fish to have the ceremony. Um, you know, this creates an inability to pass down these customs and cultures to the next generation. Uh, we've had uh, Karuk sacred, sacred sites uh, and gathering sites have been impacted by dredge mining and dredge mining camps. Uh, and these denied access to these traditional foods have direct um, impacts to Karuk spiritual life, uh, direct impacts to people's mental health, indirect impacts to people's physical health. So if you can't eat salmon and acorns and you're forced onto a, a Western diet in your Karuk, it does put you at significantly higher risk for a lot of diet related diseases, such as obesity and heart disease. And that's been documented in numerous studies. Next slide. Now, it is not solely the fault of suction dredge mining that we're in this position. It's not solely the fault of suction dredge mining that the fish numbers have plummeted and, and we're in this predicament. But I would say the legacy of mining and the suction dredge mining contributes to that. And just like logging practices and hydroelectric dams and marijuana cultivation and um, the failure to regulate adequately irrigation diversions, we have to address the impacts of suction dredge mining alongside the impacts of these other activities. Next slide, please. So really this timeline should begin in 1849. I just don't have the time to go through it all. But in 1849, when gold was discovered, it really brought uh, miners to all of California's rivers, not just the Klamath. 
but this was really began an environmental holocaust and a genocide directed at California's native people, and that was over gold. And although a lot of the mining techniques that were employed in the 1800s are no longer legal, suction dredges are a vestigial remnant of this history and should be considered and discussed in this historical context. But I do want to advance the timeline all the way up to 1994, which is really when a lot of these legal battles that led to where we are today began. And I would say that Karuk has not only held state agencies accountable, but federal agencies as well. And we fought the U.S. Forest Service all the way to the steps of the Supreme Court and won over its failure to regulate properly suction dredge mining. Uh, our legal battles with the state really began when COHO were listed and California Fish and Wildlife failed to amend its regulations um, to consider the listing and the changed conditions that was the listing of COHO salmon. Um, we quickly negotiated a settlement with the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife to amend regulations on the Klamath, which would have had sort of temporal and um, geographical restrictions. And the mining community would just not let it happen. They demanded that there be a CEQA analysis, but then California never funded the CEQA analysis to change the regulations. And that's when Karuk started forming a statewide co coalition with a lot of other partners um, the Sierra Fund, Center for Biological Diversity, um, Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations, Friends of the River, many other groups uh, to work as a coalition. And we said, look, if you're not going to fund the CEQA analysis to rewrite the mining regs, then you just have to quit giving out mining permits. And over the next few years, we, uh, I think it was maybe four pieces of legislation over six years and several um, lawsuits, um, a couple of which ended at the steps of the Supreme Court in a victory, that kind of led us to this position. And I, I highlight this history just to emphasize that this is an issue that's really important to legislators. Uh, we passed legislation to uh, place a moratorium on this activity with two-thirds majority votes in the legislature. The legislature cares about this issue and we really felt like California Department of Fish and Wildlife should have been the agency to deal with this. But um, California Fish and Wildlife refused to regulate water quality impacts. And that's why this issue got really dumped on the state water board. Next slide, please. Um, I also share this timeline and include not only the legislation we passed, but the lawsuits we fought to make the point that we're consistently winning uh, these lawsuits. California indeed has every right to regulate this activity. It is not preempted by the 1872 Mining Act or any other law. And the water board has been put in this, um, you know, we, we put the water board in this position again because we didn't feel like California Department of Fish and Wildlife was doing this part. And then we needed you guys to step in and regulate this activity to ensure compliance with the Federal Clean Water Act. Next slide, please. We've got a couple of issues. Um, the tribal consultation process described herein is inadequate. <clears throat> it was one of, the, one of the staff kind of highlighted that there has to be a 30 day uh, pre mining notification. But it doesn't really say, what if the tribe writes back and says, this doesn't work for us? What if we, the tribe writes back and says, actually, there, there are ceremonies in the area. Is the miner then uh, not permitted to mine in that area? It's really not clear from the, the regulations. And they really shouldn't be writing the tribes to tell them there's about to be mining in 30 days. It should be writing tribes to ask for permission to, to mine in tribal Aboriginal territory. Uh, we've had this issue around cannabis cultivation, and we actually get to approve or not approve permits to cultivate cannabis in Crook Aboriginal Territory in Humboldt County. That kind of uh, arrangement could be a model the uh, tribes could use to weigh in in real time on whether or not a uh, mining activity is appropriate in a tribal territory. Next slide, please. Other issues, uh, we think the, the permit is 
there, there's an inadequate funding for enforcement built into this permit. Already, we have to depend on fish and game wardens to enforce these activities. Getting an enforcement of our Clean Water Act violations will also be difficult. We think the rules are complex. As one of the staff pointed out, um, there, it's not feasible to conduct proper sampling, is what your staff person said, because of the remote nature of the activity and the inability of miners to actually do the kind of analysis it would take to determine if the activity was polluting water with these heavy metals. And it fails to consider all the species that are currently at risk of extinction. Next slide, please. And we just, we were going to, I'll just conclude by agreeing with what the Water Board had to say about this in 2013. Uh, as Fish and Game was preparing its permit, um, the Water Board actually wrote the department and said, based on the water quality impacts of recreational suction dredging, we recommend that the existing moratorium be continued indefinitely or that this activity be permanently prohibited. We don't think this activity can be done in a way that complies with the Federal Clean Water Act. And as of 2013, neither did the State Water Board. Next slide. And that's it. So I think I'm just going to stop there and I'm going to remainder my time I'd like to give to my colleagues uh, at the Center for Biological Diversity and the Sierra Fund to talk about the impacts to water quality and to various species and the legal history uh, at question here. Thank you so much. Thank you as well, Mr. Tucker. Really appreciate your time today and your comments and contribution to the discussion. Uh, next, uh, looks like it is uh, the panel consisting of Jonathan Evans from the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, we also have uh, Elizabeth Martin from the Sierra Fund, and it looks like Carrie Monahan from the Sierra Fund as well. Is that correct on uh, our next panel? That is correct, sir. Great. Uh, is there any... There is a panel, I mean a presentation, excuse me. Great. As a presentation comes up, thank you, Janine. Um, which of you, uh, Jonathan, Carrie, and Elizabeth would uh, like to go first? I see Elizabeth. I, I, I'd like to go first. Just Great. That's how we practiced. Okay. I, I, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm Izzy Martin, the CEO of the CR Fund, and I want to thank uh, the Water Board members and staff for the work you've done on this issue and for the opportunity to speak to you today about our concerns about suction dredge mining. Um, the Sierra Fund is located in the heart of the Sierra Nevada and since 2001, we have spearheaded an effort to protect and restore the state's largest headwaters, the Sierra Nevada. Specifically, we work to restore ecosystem and community resiliency with an eye toward how this resiliency can be promoted and protected into the future for vibrant and sustainable Sierra for generations to come. Next slide, please. Okay. The Sierra Fund's mission is to confront the legacy impacts of the 19th century gold rush that persists to this day in our region with implications for all of the California from the Sierra to the sea. Since we published our groundbreaking Mining's Toxic Legacy uh, report in 2008, we have been focusing public policy attention on the impacts of mining. You may have noticed that just this week, the LAO published a new report looking at the impacts of legacy mines and the need to increase the pace and scale of mine remediation. This new report called Improving California's Response to the Environmental and Safety Hazards, hazards Caused by Abandoned Mines is asking for new investment around these issues. The Sierra Fund has led pilot projects that demonstrate methods to restore ecos ecosystem function and resiliency and to protect public health. We've raised millions of dollars from public and private resources to support collaborative activities to protect and restore our headwaters. And we sponsored successful state legislation, including establishing the Sierra Nevada Conservancy and securing significant mining law reform to protect communities and water quality. Next slide, please. The Sierra Fund has been working on section dredge mining now for 15 years. Uh, we have uh, participated in many different public processes, including serving as members of the Department of Fish and Game a Public Advisory Committee, where we expressed our concerns about the nine significant and unmitigable impacts that were found by the draft environmental impact report on the fish and wildlife regulations that were proposed. 
we co-sponsored along with Karuk the SB 637 to bring the state's attention to the significant un unmitigable impacts on water quality um, based on the letter, the, uh, Tom Howard's letter that uh, Craig was just talking about with the state water boards saying that those were their, con were con their concerns. Um, in addition, we have participated in public hearings and we've met with staff over the last couple of years. And I feel we've had a very good dialogue with staff. And again, I wanna commend them for their efforts to be on this tightrope between these, uh, these uh, very complex issues. Next slide, please. Um, we think that the, there are several problems with the, the permit as it's been proposed. No, go backwards, go back. Um, the NPDS program is, we feel is not adequate and we don't feel it's necessary. As Craig just outlined, we believe the tribal consultation process is inadequate. Um, the maps that we were given in May are blurry. We just heard a staff person say they're gonna give us more maps sometime. Um, we've also done some mapping that Dr. Monahan will share with you, but it's an example of this uh, very complicated system um, that's requiring monitoring, that's complex, um, there's no enforcement capacity that we see built into this system, at least on the water quality side. Um, we believe that the water board has its clear, clear responsibility to protect water quality and be beneficial uses. We're concerned that the taxpayers will get stuck with the bill to uh, run this pro program over the long run to deal with all of the impacts that it could create if it's not done exactly surgically well. And even then, I'm not sure how you do that. Um, the economic impacts on fisheries, the economic impacts on cultural and recreational uses needs to be understood as being extremely significant. I want to drill down a little bit with the monitoring requirements on this bill, uh, on, on this, uh, this permit you've um, looked at especially the monitoring requirements for the mercury concerns that the Sierra Fund has brought to the state now since 2008 about our concerns about suction dredge mining and these mercury impacts. Dr. Monahan will explain the work we have done around mercury uh, permitting and also um, mapping. Dr. Kerry Monahan. Thanks so much for having um, us all here today. This is um, a great opportunity to drill down on a couple details or with respect to mercury. Could you go to the next slide, please? So not only does mercury have unique characteristics, it's also a really unique history in our state. We mined mercury in the coast range and brought it to hard rock and hydraulic mines where it was used extensively in order to aid in the extraction of gold millions of pounds of mercury were brought to these mine sites to be used in this way. And 10 to 30% of those millions of pounds was lost to the environment. And that is why we have liquid elemental mercury in our streams and rivers today. However, the recent studies that have been done over the last 20 years have identified a specific type of mercury, this elemental particulate bound form is of special concern. So if, if a silt or clay particle were the size of a whale, elemental mercury, this particular bound mercury would be like a cherry on that whale, which means that it would behave like silts and clays. It would stay in suspension with the silts and clays because it's attached to them and it would float long distances downstream and travel when it's disturbed. By understanding this uh, type of mercury, we now understand an important component of an ongoing source of mercury contamination to our streams and rivers of when it's disturbed. Because when that mercury settles, it can biomagnify and bioaccumulate into our food chain, which is the primary public health exposure to mercury is through fish consumption. So by re-disturbing it, it you've, we've created this ongoing exposure and exacerbated it. In addition, these recent studies have, um, have only been possible because we are doing trace metal monitoring, which is very, um, it needs ultra clean hands techniques. It needs to be sent to special laboratories. It is expensive. And um, it's very, very hard to do real time, especially the remote nature of these sites. 
So taking a sample um, when an activity is going on is going to require at least 24 hours before you have information. And that's an expedited sample to a trace metal lab. A typical turnaround is actually 30 days and, and it's expensive. So the idea of real-time monitoring is really basically um, not realistic in this case. Could you go to the next slide, please? So there are multiple studies that have been conducted to assess the potential effects of recreational suction dredge mining. And I wanna draw your attention to two of them. There's a part one and part two. These were done by USGS in cooperation with BLM and the State Water Board. They're titled The Effects of Sediment and Mercury Mobilization in the South Yuba River and Humbug Creek Confluence Area. Part one essentially says particulate bound mercury is definitely disturbed when section dredge mining activities takes place and that that particulate bound mercury stays in suspension and travels a long distance. Part two basically says that once it settles, it can be methylated and incorporated into the food chain. Thank you. Next slide. Yes, so the State Water Resources Control Board maps that were provided um, that show where suction dredge mining is uh, permitted are very hard to read. Um, and they appear to allow dredging near mine impacted lands and features. So we took the query language that was used to create these maps and the data files that were referenced and recreated them. And what we see here is that dredging may be allowed in water bodies uh, without adequate information in order to determine safety. Go ahead to the next slide, please. What I mean is that when you overlay these potentially permitted sites with the 303D impaired water bodies, you can see the proximity of the impaired water bodies with the proposed areas for section dredge mining. You can see that there is that overlap. And I just feel like reminding everyone that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. We in fact don't have data for a lot of these areas. And I'm gonna bring this point home because even in those areas where we may not have mercury data or uh, data that allows us to list the water body as impaired if, if it indeed is, we do have evidence of these um, historic activities taking place there. So go ahead and go to the next slide. This slide shows you where hard rock and hydraulic mining has occurred in our states. And as I began with, these activities used mercury extensively. So there is reason to believe that even if a water body is not currently listed as impaired, it in fact may be. And so we may be allowing suction dredge mining to occur in areas uh, where it is not safe for it to do so. Thank you. Go ahead, Izzy. Izzy. Next yeah. slide, please. Okay. So these these are really are the final comments. As you've seen, we've we've been looking at the maps. We find them hard to read. Um, I just heard uh, Mr. Haregi saying something about they're going to be improving the maps. Um, the maps seem to be a fundamental piece of this thing, um, and I think it's going to be hard to give people a map that they can't really tell where it is and is not allowed. So. Until the maps are really finalized and you can give us the final maps, I think you need to give us more time. You need to find, we need to see these, these, these maps. We need to be able to study them. We'd like to get the list of the river segments that are involved so we can look at how that lines up with the data sources that we're familiar with that may not be the Department of Conservation's um, list that we just showed you or your fellow um, Cal EPA um, agency people over there, the Department of Toxic Substances control who have been mapping this. Um, we of course work closely with the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment around the fish advisory and, and uh, the public health components of this as well as with the Department of Public Health itself. So we feel that there's a lot of uh, more information that needs to be reflected in, in these maps and in these documents. Um, and I want to underscore that we really believe um, as the sponsors of SB 637 that the board does have the latitude in using that law to say we don't see how we can protect California water quality with this specialized permit for recreational section dredge mining. 
Um, I'll remind the board that there's other ways, you know, mining happens all over the state. There's hundreds, you know, thousands of mines open all over the state. They all go through an entirely different process um, that is called the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act permitting process. So it, for real professional miners, people that are making their living mining, um, this isn't even the permit for them. This, uh, th this, is a, this, this apparently is a permit for recreational miners. Um, if you're a professional miner, you have to go over to the Surface Mining Act. And I really don't know how we divide that, how we uh, suss that out. Um, so again, I think there's a lot of questions about this permit. Um, we appreciate your patience, your willingness to listen to us. Um, I'll be around to answer questions if you have any. Um, I want to thank you again for this opportunity and again to your staff. Um, and uh, I think our next speaker on our panel is Jonathan Evans. Thank you. Oh, what last slide shows my contact information. Last slide, please. There you go. Brand new address. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Evans. Good morning, members of the State Water Resources Control Board and staff. Um, thank you for putting up the presentation. My name is Jonathan Evans. I'm the Environmental Health Legal Director and Senior Attorney at the Center for Biological Diversity. The Center for Biological Diversity relies on science, law, and creative media to protect our lands, waters, and climate um, from, and, and climate that imperiled wildlife and human communities need to survive. We have over 1.7 million members throughout the world, including over 70,000 members and supporters in California. We have been involved with um, the coalition working to protect California's waterways and wildlife and human communities from such and dredge mining for over a decade, um, following the leadership of the group tribe and the work that they've done in the Sierra Fund. I'll be talking today, uh, next slide please. I'll be talking today about two main things. Um, one thing you've heard echoed earlier today is that we may need to make sure that the state board has the adequate and necessary data to issue the permit correctly. And that there is a very strong, um, uh, previous slide please, thank you. Uh, and that there is a very strong legal basis for mining prohibitions and the prohibitions on water quality impacts as a result of suction dredge mining. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I want to thank the state board staff for providing um, the, ge the geographic information system mapping that was uh, provided on July 15th. Um, many organizations, uh, well, a couple organizations such as our Center for Biological Diversity and the Sierra Fund have been able to manipulate this data, but we do recognize that the data was simply provided uh, several weeks ago and this type of complex watershed by watershed analysis really does require more time. So we really and expertise. Not all organizations are going to have the ability to sort of manipulate that GIS data. Um, so we do request that the State Water Board provide a more detailed mapping process before the public comment period ends um, so that the public does have a greater ability to engage in this. So we do request an extension of the August 24th uh, comment period in order to consider some data such as the important data that we are providing here on this map. This map provides an overlay of Endangered Species Act critical habitat with proposed areas that are open for suction dredge mining in California. And we can see that even with the um, limitations on suction dredge mining the State Board has proposed, that critical habitat for over a dozen species would still be impacted by the proposed opening for suction dredge mining. And again, this doesn't include the full range of rare, sensitive, threatened, or endangered species that would be impacted in all of these watersheds this is merely a subset of Endangered Species Act listed species that have critical habitat map. So this is an under-inclusive list, but you can still see that there are over a dozen species um, that would be affected at, at least. And then this also doesn't account for um, potential um, songbird species that require, that are impacted by riparian um, activities such as suction dredge mining, but it does include a range of species such as um, California red-legged frog, mountain yellow-legged frog, um, Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog, Yosemite toad, as well as several anadromous fish species such as Chinook salmon or steelhead. Next slide, please. I'll also be providing a uh, discussion today on the strong legal basis that the State Water Board has to prohibit suction dredge mining activity. Uh, 
providing one snapshot of the federal legal framework this, the Water Board is working within. Um, I'm sure that uh, Council for the Water Board has also provided some of this information, but I'll just reiterate the strong basis that the Water Board has. The General Mining Law of 1872 um, states that rights exist only so long as they comply with the laws of the United States and with the state, territorial, and local regulations. So the mining rights aren't sacrosanct. They're basically cabined in very importantly by other existing laws, such as federal laws like the Clean Water Act that the State Water Board is implementing, as well as state laws that the legislature has passed in order to um, limit the dangers of suction dredge mining. And this uh, ability of the states to regulate mining activity has been affirmed by the California Supreme Court, or excuse me, by the U.S. Supreme Court in a case from California uh, called California Coastal Commission versus Granite Rock Company, where the uh, a mine a company did propose to mine on Forest Service property when the Coastal Commission required them to to obtain a, a permit prior to mining. They sued. Um, the the, Cal the U.S. Supreme Court said that there is no intent to preempt state laws in the General Mining Law of 1872. So the state stands. Um, very strongly footed in order to regulate this activity. Next slide, please. And California has been incredibly active in making sure that the um, state isn't impacted by suction dredge mining. As uh, noted earlier by Mr. Tucker from the uh, representative from the group tribe, the state legislature has acted uh, four times in six years under a bipartisan um, uh, governorship under both Governor Schwarzenegger and Governor Brown to ensure proper regulations are in place to protect the environment, water quality, and human health from the harmful impacts of suction dredge mining. You would be hard pressed to find an environmental issue that the legislature has deemed uh, more important to act, to engage in more, more than four times in six years. So it really shows that there's a, a strong desire to regulate this activity. I'll be talking about the Cal Fish and Game Code and the Cal Water Code separately. Uh, the SB 617, uh, importantly, required a, a revision of the California Fish and Game Code to uh, require water quality permit or finding that we're here uh, discussing today. It also requires that all this, the significant environmental impacts from such and dredge mining must be fully mitigated. This is a very high standard you don't particularly see very often. And so it really shows the, the interest of the legislature to make sure that these impacts um, don't occur. It also requires a revenue neutral program. The legislature was very clear that recreational suction dredge mining should not be subsidized by the taxpayers. And importantly, as mentioned earlier, it does not restrict non-motorized non -motorized recreational mining activities such as panning for gold. Uh, in, next slide, please. And the California Water Code also has parallel provisions enacted by the legislature for uh, SB 617. Uh, it requires the legislature to consider mercury and metals from suction dredge mining and discharge requirements. It authorizes prohibitions on suction dredge mining discharges when there are adverse impacts on beneficial uses and authorizes prohibitions on suction dredge mining equipment that contribute to water quality violations. And this is important because as we mentioned earlier in that critical habitat map, the California Water Code 13172.5b specifically related to suction dredge to state water board permitting of suction dredge mining requires the consideration of beneficial uses such as wildlife. So um, it really is imperative that the um, state water board provide the type of mapping activities and the analysis of the impacts to species that do occur in, in the areas that are, it's proposing to open the suction dredge mining that are currently closed. Next slide, please. And California isn't alone. Uh, the West Coast uh, of the United States has acted uh, significantly to restrict suction dredge mining. Uh, Oregon passed a bill in uh, 2017 to prohibit suction dredge, suction dredge mining in essential salmonid habitat. Uh, also required a, a National Pollution Discharge Elimination System general permit or individual water quality permit. Washington similarly just this year uh, passed a bill prohibiting suction dredge mining in critical habitat for endangered salmon steelhead and trout, requires suction dredge miners to obtain a water quality permit. Um, Alaska and Idaho have a dual permitting system of requiring uh, a NIPDES permit, as well as a separate individual mining permit. So we know that the uh, state agencies are uh, well authorized to prohibit mining in habitat for salmonid species, and we see that there is a conflict right now. There is that are proposed to be open. 
um, for suction dredge mining and uh, very important salmon species as well as endangered species. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, we'll just point out a couple court cases that have occurred in the past several years related to some of these state laws um, that have consistently affirmed the state's ability to regulate suction dredge mining under state law. First is the People versus Reinhardt, a uh, case that went to the California Supreme Court where the Supreme Court held that the uh, general mining law of 1872 does not preempt state laws regulating suction dredge mining, the laws we're talking about here that created the moratorium. Um, the mining community sought to have that reviewed by the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court denied to hear that case. The California Supreme Court case is the law. Um, the next case, uh, again, involving suction dredge mining uh, on the West Coast in Oregon, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held that Oregon's law prohibiting suction dredge mining in streams that support runs of wild salmon and steelhead is not preempted by federal laws affirming the state's ability to prohibit suction dredge mining in areas that affect endangered species and essential um, salmon species. Um, that again was uh, the minor sought review in the, at the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court denied to hear that case. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case is the law that stands. And most recently in Eastern Oregon Mining Association versus Department of Environmental Quality, the Oregon Supreme Court held that the um, Environmental Protection Agency or its state delegate, in this case, the state water board here in, in California, but in the case in Oregon, it was the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, had the authority to issue a permit under Section 402 for processed, mine, processed waste discharge as a result of suction dredge mining. Again, affirming the state's strong ability to control the pollution from these activities. So we know the state water board sits on firm ground in order to regulate and prohibit these activities. We encourage the state water board to uh, maintain strong prohibitions uh, in areas that would uh, negatively impact beneficial uses as well as water quality. And I thank the opportunity for the board to, to speak here today and encourage the board to really allow the public to get the necessary information, get the necessary information that's necessary to, um, to uh, conduct a rigorous analysis of the permit and areas that are proposed for open opening under the suction dredge mining permit. Thank you for your time today. And that's the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Evans. Uh, with that, I think we'll continue on to our, our next panel and appreciate everyone's comments, taking notes. Uh, I'll have some comment and guidance for, um, for folks, but want to move through the panels and then maybe have a moment to think and reflect and then move on to public comment. Um, I think just to be fair for uh, the three panels. So uh, again, thank you. Uh, next we have uh, our panel with uh, Shannon Poe from the American Mining Rights Association, along with uh, Kevin Hoagland from the Gold Prospectors Association of America and Robert uh, Gord Gordolia with the Mining Districts Association. And um, we'll see, uh, Mr. Mr. Poe, would you like to uh, uh, go first amongst the panelists here? Yes, thank you. Great, good morning. Good to see good you. Good morning. Well, we have a little video presentation and I'll save some of my comments um, to address some of the things that I've heard today at the end of the video. So if we could just start the, the video would be great. Great, I think the, our technicians are pulling that up now for you. My name is Shannon Poe and I'm president of American Mining Rights Association. And I'm here on behalf of more than 110,000 small scale miners in the state of California. And we stand in complete opposition to what we believe is a takings of our real property and rending, rendering those properties fallow. These are valuable mineral deposits, which we were granted a fundamental right 
to obtain those valuable minerals, which most are underwater in the state of California. Suction dredging is the only viable and economical method that we can use to obtain those mineral deposits. There is not one miner, not one, that we know of that supports this dredge scheme by the California Water Board. This started about two decades ago uh, by a, a lady who's going to be presenting today. Her name is Elizabeth Martin with Sierra Fund and who's also received about 14 million dollars in grants over the last eight or nine years. Um, and that led to Senate Bill 637 which was brought forward by a Democrat senator from Hollywood who we're quite certain has never even seen a dredge before he met Ms. Martin. And that brings us to why we are here today, which is the suction dredge scheme that the California Water Board is presenting uh, to the Board of Directors uh, for them to make a decision on. For over 100,000 people, uh, this board is tasked with the fates of these real property mining claims. So originally, this was all about salmon. And when that scam failed, they moved on to mercury, and now that mercury has moved on to toxicity. So some facts to start with. The salmon levels, since the ban, which was created in 2009, we've not been able to legally dredge in the state for 11 plus years. The salmon populations have actually decreased, and the mercury levels have risen. So it kind of flies in the face of their argument if we're out there stirring up all this mercury and they test waters, then why would the mercury levels be increasing? Well, there's a simple solution to that, and that is because it's not the dredgers. The dredging, in fact, and this is a proven scientific fact that even the California Water Board admits, is that the very activity of suction dredging removes mercury from the waterways. It should be actually encouraged. Let's look at the economic impact that this moratorium, the prohibition, and now the all out ban on suction dredging on any of the valuable mineral deposits in California has caused just in the last 11 years. So there was a study done in the mid to, mid to late 2000s where over $60 million a year was being sent or spent by miners in the state of California. They would come and spend money in the rural communities, which are very, very hard hit right now, in motels, gas stations, hardware stores, uh, and through permitting. And if you do the math on that over the last 11 years, um, that's over $600 million that in revenue that has been lost in this state. Not to mention the economic impact that it's had in those rural communities. You could drive anywhere on Highway 49 and go look at some of these towns and look at the devastation that has happened in, uh, in these communities because the people aren't up there. And it's not all because of the dredgers aren't there, but it's certainly a dramatic impact, um, especially along the Yuba, the American, and in places like that. The passage of Senate Bill 637 made anything that was mechanized or motorized in the state a suction dredge. They call it a suction dredge. So running a vacuum cleaner out in the desert of Barstow, that most certainly isn't a suction dredge, but that under this definition, which the California Water Board does not address at all, would be subject to citations and fines and confiscation. A post hole digger. We even know of a gentleman that was threatened because he drove his truck down to a waterway within a hundred yards. The officer said that that was aiding in the processing of his material and his truck could be confiscated. That's how absurd that this has become. And at what point do you recognize this has nothing to do with science or facts or reality and everything to do with an agenda? The California Water Board has an MOA, that's a Memorandum of Agreement, with the EPA to enforce the Clean Water Act in the state. And about two months ago, we participated in an online um, Zoom meeting where very, very few of the miners in the state of California had a chance to participate and understand what 
all of this regulatory permitting scheme was going to entail and how it would affect them. And we asked them point blank in that meeting, which of the 129 pollutants that are identified by the EPA and the Clean Water Act um, does suction dredging, the, the activity of suction dredging, add? And they didn't define any of those 129 items that are listed by the EPA. What they came back with was toxicity. So it would appear as if the California Water Board is fabricating a pollutant to satisfy an ideology. Dredgers remove, not add, any pollutants. They remove mercury, they remove lead, they remove fishing hooks and weights and all of the trash that's thrown in the river. They are not a point source and it is called incidental fallback for a reason. Back in 2001, the EPA, because they wanted to determine how much mercury the, the suction dredgers were actually removing from the California waters, they created this program called the Milk Run, which we have Kerry Monahan here um, from the Sierra Fund, uh, and I'm sure Ben Allen will see this. They both said that it was unfortunate that this program was shut down because it was too successful. And what happened was the suction dredgers turned in 240 plus pounds of mercury in that one year of 2001. 240 pounds. But the government shut it down because it was too successful. Only government could turn down a program that's too successful. So then we asked, how far does this toxicity travel downstream? And the California Water Board wouldn't answer our question during that call and it took subsequent emails and phone calls and requests over a month and a half to get a reply. And the reply was about 500 feet. So under this assumption, and that's what it is because it's an assumption, that this toxicity travels downstream 500 feet, that doesn't even go off of the miner's claim. It most certainly doesn't go 15 miles downstream into any kind of a watershed. What we can determine is that they seem to be hanging their hat on the 40 mile study, which was done on a river in Alaska. But what they failed to mention in that study is that there was less mercury out of the back of the dredge than there was going into the dredge. So there's scientific evidence that supports the fact that a suction dredge actually removes mercury and to not want the mercury out of the waterways, which we agree is a toxic chemical, is like saying you should never ever vacuum your carpet for fear that you might get a speck of dust on your coffee table. It really defies logic. There has never been one documented case of any mercury poisoning from eating any California sport fish ever, ever in the history of the state. The levels in of mercury in California fish are much lower now than when occurred during the Japanese outbreak. There's a recent study that was published Environmental Science and Technology and it was funded by the Research Council of Norway and by the Norwegian Climate and Pollution Agency. And in this study what it does is it compares mercury levels or mercury toxicity as opposed to how it reacts with selenium. And to make a long story short, what they're saying in here is measuring mercury in animals may therefore provide an inadequate reflection of the potential health risks to humans and wildlife if the protective effects of selenium are not considered. The California Water Board never addresses anything that has to do with selenium and all they do is rely on a study that was done, you know, 30 years ago up in Alaska. So simply put, what we're saying is whether or not toxic effects accompany exposure to mercury, it depends upon the tissue, um, selenium, mercury, molar ratio of the organism. So without taking those kind of things into consideration, uh, we believe that there's a very, very strong case to all the public health agencies on their neglectful use 
of only considering mercury tissue analysis results when determining when to issue a potential risk warning to the public who consume fish. We believe that it was required that other agencies be consulted when determining the suction dredge regulations, obviously CDFG, California Health, uh, California Public Health, and without taking these considerations uh, into play on this type of regulatory scheme, uh, we believe that it is completely neglectful. The Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment is the department that puts out the mercury fish consumption warnings. Their job is to protect and enhance public health by scientific evaluation of risks posed by these hazardous substances. They are definitely neglect in their directive to do a scientific evaluations of the risks of mercury to consumers by not considering the presence of selenium. So we're formally putting the California Water Board as well as numerous other agencies on notice that they can make no adverse determination of the toxicity of mercury without also having in hand the selenium levels associated with said mercury fish tissue analysis. Otherwise, all you have is nothing, nothing less than, as the old saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. So let's talk a little bit about how Governor Newsom feels about science. And I'm going to just read a couple of quotes here. And this is pretty much everything that I'm going to read here has to do with recent things that he said just in the last month or so about the COVID um, pandemic. And I'll quote here. At some point in the future, we will need to modify our stay at home order, Newsom said in the comment. As we contemplate reopening parts of our state, we must be guided by science and data. Here's another one. We began a process of establishing more formally what it would look like and how we, would, we could begin the process of the kind of incremental release of the stay at home orders that advance the fundamental principle of keeping people healthy, keeping people safe, using science to guide our decision making and not political pressure. We must continue to share our best practices and share our resolve. Here's another one. So again, in the spirit of collaboration, spirit of partnership, a recognition that this pandemic, the virus knows no boundaries, knows no borders. You can't build a wall around it and you can't deny, deny basic fundamental facts. And again, before I transition, we will be driven by facts. We will be driven by evidence. We will be driven by science and we will be driven by our public health advisors. So Governor Newsom is even saying that these things need to be driven by facts, by science. And what we have here is based on assumptions. So let's talk about assumptions. Two years ago, Jerry Clements and I, we sat down in a closed door meeting with Eileen Sobek, the director, uh, Jonathan Bishop, who I think is the assistant director, Phil Crater and one other with the California Water Board. During that meeting, she said that she had planned to prohibit suction dredging activities in some areas. Okay, so we asked her, what areas? What does that mean? And she replied, anywhere there was historical mining because our assumption, and that's quote, is that they used mercury. When we ask, have you done studies to prove this assumption on all areas? where historical mining took place, she replied, no. We then asked her, do you plan to test or study all the areas you are prohibiting suction dredging on? And she replied, no. So the entire map that they have released here where suction dredging is allowed and where, pro, uh, where it is prohibited is based on an assumption, it's based on feelings. How can you make a ruling that is a going to affect over a hundred thousand people based on no facts, no science, no data. Just because somebody dug a hole 150 years ago, you're going to prohibit and literally make that piece of property fallow to where it's not economically viable anymore. To me, that's reprehensible. Recently, we submitted a proposal where the small mining community could self-regulate and could collect the mercury and 
to meet the requirements under the Clean Water Act. And we just want to be treated like any other industry, like ag or sand and gravel, which they have permits and they're digging with excavators in the Bear River and in places like that. We believe that we should be feeded, uh, treated fairly and equally as the other industries in the state. So in summary, this entire small scale mining community in the state of California vociferously and unanimously opposed this political scheme. It destroys our property values, makes our valuable mineral deposits worthless, which we all pay property taxes on in this state, the scheme is unfair, it's tyrannical in nature, and we believe exposes the California Water Board to significant legal exposure, especially because it's based on an assumption and they're not even studying the effects, the modern science effects, of selenium and mercury. Basing a prohibition on an assumption, fabricated theories devoid of facts result in miners' properties being rendered worthless because of severe an unwarranted overregulation, which we feel is criminal. Do not approve of this scheme. Allow the miners to work with the California Water Board to adopt a self-regulating alternative as opposed to an all-out prohibition as this one is. Allowing somebody to suction dredge in the downtown Bakersfield, but not on any of the deposits of gold in the entire mother load is absurd. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple more quick comments to make here. And we showed a couple of slides there, one of a suction dredge with about a 50 or 60 foot plume coming out of the back of that. Now a suction dredge operates basically on a lawnmower size engine. And then we actually put up some pictures of the flood events that happen almost on an annual basis where every single thing in the river moves all the way down to bedrock. But the contention here is that, you know, we're the cause of all of these problems and fish deaths and aquatic insects and all these different things when there's never any mention at all on what Mother Nature does every single year. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Robert Guardiola for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> in the nature of, of time, I'm going to kind of cut uh, my talk a little shorter than what I anticipated. I'll uh, send that to you in uh, in writing. But there was a couple of uh, different, uh, uh, just, I guess, um, points of, of comment. I, I know Izzy had uh, pointed out that, um, you know, the big corporations can go out and do the, the studies and things like that. Uh, but in her uh, analogy there, that's like comparing uh, Microsoft um, Corporation to the guy that uh, comes and fixes my computer. Um, it compares the, the, the lady that, that uh, makes all amounts of clothes and sells it out at a, a flea market or a festival <clears throat> to Levi. Uh, two different companies, two different areas. But one thing I want to remind you is that all of our mining starts out small. It starts out with a pan, it starts out with a, a, a shovel, and it graduates through these processes. And what this has done is essentially uh, eliminated those small scale pro uh, processes that can make a large corporation. So in, f in effect, you're banning mining and the future of large companies to even develop new uh, properties. Um, they don't just go out and spend all the money uh, to, to qualify the property to dig a big pit or move a mountain or, or whatever their, their technology is doing. Uh, they start out small to see if that property is viable, uh, to see if it, it, it will produce. Um, and you've basically taken away all those tools to get to that next step for the miner. Um, you know, you've got a guy on here talking about mining law, Reinhardt. And, um, granite rock and things like that. And of course, he's looking for the, the points um, that support his argument. And, and it, you know, we all do that. But if you look at the whole bodies of those, even Reinhardt on page 28 goes back to 
Uh, these were actually decisions that should have been made by the mining districts, absent nobody here representing the mining districts. Um, you know, I've got to make that that decision. Uh, well, I'm telling you, the mining districts are here. Uh, they just weren't looked for or used in that particular argument. Uh, basically, what this boils down to is this permit frustrates uh, what this land was put aside for. It frustrates mining. It frustrates the the ability uh, to utilize the lands as they were they were set aside. Um, it uh, and I'm just going to kind of quote, and I'll turn this over to to Kevin on the, the last few uh, pages. But uh, basically, no minor group or association in the mining community can even function, um, <clears throat> excuse me, explore or extract minerals under this permit. It just, it prohibits mining, period, in California. Mining is what made this country great. It's what made California great. It, uh, what this does is sends more jobs overseas. It sends more jobs to China and India and, and Afghanistan, places that don't take our environment seriously like we do. Um, a dredge uh, in this instance, as well as our other materials, these are things that are reclaimed daily. We have to go by the same laws that, that uh, the big miners do. We have to reclaim, we have to fill the holes. We have to, to be conscious of what we're doing. We've developed uh, equipment that does exactly that. Um, in the instance of, of uh, the dredge, it drops right back out on your heavies. Um, we are performing probably better than most large companies on the re reclamation of our holes and, and things of, of that, that uh, sort. Um, it's an environmentally safe practice. It's a, uh, a practice that, that needs to be uh, opened up and you need to uh, actually disregard what we're doing here because this frustrates mining, frustrates the law, it frustrates the, the agreements between uh, state and federal uh, organizations. And uh, it basically bankrupts an industry starting at the bottom up. You're, you're gonna bankrupt, bankrupt the big boys too here because you're just taking those properties out of play that will eventually become bigger, bigger mines. So with that, I'll, I'll submit more in writing to you um, on this, but uh, looking at the time, um, I'll, I'll forfeit or not forfeit, but I'll, I'll transfer over to, to Kevin um, and, and let him go with his uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guardiola. And I will you know, flag again, uh, we're right now going through the panel, so we're, we are just listening and there'll be some discussion and, and opportunity, I'm sure, for further question and follow up. So I uh, just appreciate the, the presentation and um, we'll uh, let Mr. Uh, Bogart uh, present now. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Kevin Hoglin. Sorry to mispronounce your last name there. Try to try to do it off of memory, and it didn't work. Good morning. My name is Kevin Hoagland. I'm the executive director of development for the Gold Prospectors Association of America. Uh, and I want to thank the State Water Resource Control Board and the attendees for their presentations this morning during this hearing. And with all respect and to save time, uh, I'm going to refer to the board as the water boards going forward. My questions today are, and I'm sorry, I'm having to move things around a little bit. Um, my questions today are directed and I'm looking for answers from Mr. Mallory Jones. And this is in response to his email dated August 3rd to my original questions and then subsequent emails dating back to May 28th of 2020. So for the record, it is our understanding that the intent of the water board is to create a suction dredge permit that incorporates and reflects federal law as you stated in your email. Mr. Jo Mr. Mallory Jones, is this correct? I'm, I'm sorry, um, 
Mr. Hoagland, if you can just provide your public comment uh, first, and I appreciate uh, wanting follow-up from staff, but um, just in the interest of fairness and uh, provide your comment to us, and then we can, I'm sure, have follow-up uh, back and forth. So if you have questions, uh, just ask them now of us as the board and I'm sure we can follow up. So. Okay, uh, my questions are very simple. Do you believe that the, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> Do you, does the state, the, does the water board believe that the determinations from the two cases, which you mentioned in your email, which was Rybacek and also the National Mining Association or my association case, uh, have been re properly reflected in the proposed suction dredge mining permit? My second question is, does the water board see the correlation between the 404 and the 402 permit? And does the water board believe that the proposed suction dredge permit recognizes, reflects, and incorporates all federal law as required in the MOA between the EPA and the state of California? Those are my three questions. And my last question is wanting to understand something more, more specifically we realize that there is a suction dredge, I'm sorry, excuse me. We also realize that the suction dredge permit recognizes, ex, excuse me, ex, wow, <laughs> I am so sorry, my mouth went completely dry. We recognize that the dredge permit recognizes exceptions and that a dredge operator can receive a letter from the water board that states that they do not need a permit. Is this correct? This is a question that I would like to have answered. Uh, Chair Esquivel, this is Phil Wiles. Maybe I could Wiles. talk a little bit about um, questions and answers because we're also getting some questions that are being um, emailed to the clerk sort of live time. And I just wanna make sure everybody has the same expectations about questions. And it's absolutely appropriate to ask questions. Uh, the best way to do that so that um, staff can give a fully reasoned response, of course, is through the written comment letter process. Uh, as of right now, the deadline for submitting those uh, written comment letters is August 24th at noon. So plenty of time to absorb everything that's heard today and then uh, submit any questions that people have as part of the written comment letters. Uh, just wanted to make sure that everyone's sort of on the same page about that. Certainly, if the board members have questions for staff, we'll be more than happy to answer them uh, during today's hearing. Yes, appreciate that, Mr. Wiles. Um, it, this, again, this is uh, an opportunity for oral or, or uh, verbal comment and receiving, and we are taking notes, uh, but to ensure that we get to each and every one of uh, very detailed questions and important ones, Mr. Hoagland, uh, make sure they are submitted written as well, uh, because then we will, we will have uh, a record to then respond to officially through the, the public comment period. So um, saying, uh, I appreciate the, the two questions or several questions therein. Um, and just for, for sake of time, I uh, just want to make sure if you are, are, are done, Mr. Uh, Hoagland, for your presentation, and then was going to kick it off to uh, board members for a little back and forth from the three panels uh, that we've heard some follow-up questions and discussion, but wanted to make sure that officially you're, you're done with your presentation first. Mr. Yes, Hoagland. I am. Okay, good. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Wiles, for the, yes, the reminder of how, how best we can make sure that we are being responsive to every specific question that folks may have. And that the context of this is for the oral, uh, receiving, uh, again, uh, oral, oral comments from folks and uh, some back and forth here in the workshop with board members. Uh, now that the, the three panels are done at this point, uh, quick time check, and we're at 11.15. Um, open up to any board members uh, insofar as uh, thoughts or uh, follow-up questions. I know that there is what I have heard a consistent concern about uh, really a lack of uh, specific data insofar as the maps that we've provided and uh, what that means for both uh, the stakeholders uh, on all sides here. Uh, so really feeling uh, there is a need to make sure we get some higher resolution maps out and data uh, uh, I know that there was a request somewhere in there that that happened. 
prior to the public comment period ending and if, if necessary, extending the public comment period. Um, yeah, open to, to thoughts amongst board members. I think, again, it is really important that we have something uh, a little more finite, a little more granular, if you will, for analysis, for, for everyone to understand the impact of what's being proposed in the discussion. And so um, I think it's reasonable there, uh, seeing as uh, I hear it was a common concern amongst amongst our panelists of wanting to have a, a little greater, uh, again, you know, resolution, higher granularity on what it is uh, where we will be proposing there is some allowance here or or not. And, the, and then there's, uh, yeah, I would just uh, thematically, I think that is a thing that I heard most through those three panels and would sort of offer up for discussion amongst board members if they choose now. Um, we can also take a break here soon, but um, yeah, open to I, that. Board I, member Dota. I agree with what you just said, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it is important, and I actually was going to ask staff <clears throat> to address the issue of when they think they might be able to provide maps with more uh, details, more granularity, and 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 I think it is very important, not only for the stakeholders, but I know for me as a decision maker to better understand where things are going to be allowed, where things are not, what the associated concerns for are geographically, how close are they to impacted water bodies, uh, given the local geology, the local you know, uh, hydrology, what might be the potential impacts and all of that I think is still information that um, le I would like to see. Um, so, you know, I, I, mean, I look forward to hearing the other commenters and obviously reading um, the written comments that come in and hearing responses from staff. But for now, I, I would agree with you that some additional information, additional details, uh, better maps are definitely needed. I'll just that I'll, I'll third that um, that vote that was certainly something that came up earlier when I saw the draft permit and I was concerned about the um, resolution of the map really not being able to provide a good sense for where the mining would be prohibited and for what reason and and you know conversely where it would be allowed so it looks like at least one stakeholder group has some of the shape files provided to them in the GIS data. So I would hope that we could make that more broadly available to others, to everyone who's interested, including myself. And, you know, I know it takes time to put together a map um, on the, you know, on the web and, and things of that nature. So, you know, just as we're thinking through the comment period and the significance of the statewide um, permit, um, I do think it may be beneficial if it takes some time to provide this information to, to think about whether um, pushing the comment period out a bit longer makes sense in light of that um, the information needing to get out. Thank you, board member. Um, any other thoughts from folks? I had just some questions. Um, uh, so, um, and this is probably to staff as follow up to some of the questions or issues um, that were asked. I think, um, uh, so can you, um, can staff clarify on the tribal consultation concerns, um, whether, how, how that, um, how, how they see um, tribal consultation needs addressed in this? It sounded like what I heard was that there were concerns that there were just notice requirements, but not actual um, need for permissions or sort of um, respect for the um, processes that were developed for um, tribal consultation by tribes. And I just wanna want to understand, is that a um, uh, something that, that, is that how staff understands um, the requirements? Is this an area of um, you know, misunderstanding, or is this, um, you know, an intentional difference in um, what, how, how staff's proposing the permit from how stakeholders are, are um, asking for? Um, 
Are this you is... asking for a staff response now? Yeah, I mean, you can, or you can do it at the end, but I just, I had some questions for staff on a couple of things, just following up from the presentation. So this was one. All right, very good. We're available um, if you'd like to have the response now. Sure, that'd be great. Okay, great. So thank you. Um, this is Diana Messina and I'm a surface water permitting section chief for our division of water quality. And um, yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Firestone. This is not, uh, I think this might be a matter of staff needing to be a little further educated on the proper and respectful uh, way to communicate to a Native American tribe. Um, yes, we did receive um, the information and the request um, from the tribal representatives that uh, we incorporate a 60-day advance notice um, to a tribe for before a miner wants to go out and mine. Because when we thought this through, 60 days would be two months and that just to us for not being as educated it just seems it seemed like a long time um basically right now we reduce that to 30 days just to give a little bit more practicality to the miners um, and what is proposed right now is that um, each approved miner uh, submits a annual um, log of when they plan to go out and mine in the next year and with that log they would have to um, inform the tribes at least 30 days in advance of their first proposed mining activity um, it is of our intention that if a tribal representative states that this would interfere with um, any of the beneficial uses or, or uh, any plans they have that we would that that means the miners would not be allowed to mine on those days and at those locations. Um, today, this hearing was very informative to me listening to um, the speaker in which um, we should all be requesting to the tribe um, to be uh, to, to use uh, either their property or to conduct any activity that may interfere with their um, culture. So with that, we do remain open, but for a direct answer, we did reduce it to 30 days, just simply on practicality. Okay, great, that's helpful. So it sounds like that's an area we'll, staff will be following up um, with tribes and stakeholders to um, Kind of clarify and, and refine, um, and I, and that the the um, you know the intention it, it is not just notice, but some sort of permission in that um, you know that there would be um, you know the 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 respect for tribes to be able to say that's not um, something that can happen at that time or um, in otherwise would impact the tribe. So. Um, Anyway, that's that's helpful clarification. It sounds like there'll be follow up on that. I appreciate it. And it also sounds like I know board members have raised this, but just, you know, it's one thing to make GIS um, available, but it's also just like, uh, as I think people have said, not everyone can, you know, I don't have GIS technology um, to overlay things myself. Um, you know, if it sounds like, and my understanding is that staff can and will, um, Kind of take time to sit down with stakeholders um you know stakeholder representatives at least um to work through the specifics um and sort of drill down in areas um so in addition to making you know gis and more high detailed maps um just more available um it's also just kind of then walking through to understand what that um what that actually means for, you know, especially the, the areas that, that there's obviously concerns around. Um, so is that, is that possible or is that how staff's um, uh, thinking about being able to follow up on the sort of mapping concerns or, or it's not just mapping, but on the specifics of where these different requirements apply? Uh, board member, if I respond, um, this is sorry. Phil Craterman. I respond, and I'm sorry, this is, you're getting probably multiple people answering here. Um, 
I want to respond on your mapping question first, and then actually, if it's okay, I would like to also jump back to the tribal consultation issue just really quickly. So first on the mapping question that you have, um, the GIS gives a lot of capabilities to analyze, but it comes at the cost of being, you know, technically challenging. And also a lot of people don't have the software. So what we put out there with these maps was our first pass at just floating a concept to the board and to the public in a way that it could be viewed and the concept could sort of be grasped, but the details aren't there and you need the GIS to have those details. So what we've done in the meantime is anybody who has requested the files, we've provided the files to them and I don't have the names of all the parties, but we've provided files to a number of people. What we're gonna do based on what we're hearing today is we propose we will work with IT to host those files online so that anybody who has the capability can get them and manipulate them how they'd like. And then we will also make ourselves available to work with anybody who needs extra assistance as you're suggesting. Okay. Um, hopefully that'll work in the meantime. Um, and we do acknowledge that they, they were just a rough cut, but they do, the concept is there. It's just where the line is in a watershed is difficult to ascertain from a picture. So we appreciate the, the concern you're raising. Um, does that answer your question on maps? Yeah, no, and I think that probably, I think all of us have asked about that, but that, that helps clarify, so thank you, yeah. May I jump back to the consultation issue quickly? I also wanna just throw out there that during the discussions with all the different stakeholders and interested parties, um, we also received input from the mining community to reduce the time, and I, I don't recall offhand, but it was somewhere on the order of like a week or perhaps even less. And so it's for us, it's a struggle to choose a night, you know, the correct number. Really, it just boils down to a policy call. So what we did is we wanted to get a draft out to the public to promote conversation and get comments from the public to the board members. That's what the 30 days that's in there does. It does not strike uh, the balance that I think we're hearing from the tribes on um, asking for permission versus simply notifying and this is a tough issue for us because as it's set up right now if somebody were notified if a tribal representative were notified and just choose to not respond then no activity would ever occur and maybe that's the way it needs to be it really is a policy issue and i don't necessarily have a right answer but we're looking for input and we'll definitely work to make sure that you're aware of all the input that we receive and we can make a good decision great yeah no i, I think that I'd love to, I mean, you know, again, I'm, I, it sounds like, um, you know, staff are going to be following up with the, tri the, the tribes um, specifically on this. And I think, um, you know, definitely would like to hear how um, that gets resolved. And uh, I appreciate that work. Um, another question I had was really around uh, you know, I think we uh, we heard a lot about um, uh, concerns about data um, from uh, the mining community around whether, you know, sort of the, the assumptions that we're making around risk um, and sort of lack of really site specific data um, throughout. And I'm, I'm, you know, I guess my question is, it sounds like there is, um, you know, an effort that, um, the mining communities going through uh, or, or pursuing to help um, develop more site specific data. Um, you know, my understanding is that through the water quality um, permitting or, you know, through through our um, general permits um, and, uh, you know, overall, um, I think we've done this through basin plan amendments where we, um, you know, make assumptions um, based on science and, and existing data um, that are really determinations of risk. Um, and so uh, as we make those determinations, um, if there are site specific data um, or studies that are developed, um, is how, how do we deal with um, you know, incorporating those site specific data and information into, um, uh, you know, the, the particular permit um, 
applications or you know revisions of general permit requirements um, for those really site specific uh, areas in which there's uh, much more data than um, or, or differences than what um, you know overall uh, existing data and science is showing. Can you just help uh, at a high level walk through how that how we address that? Sure, this is Phil Crater again. Um, and I, I think we built in as you're as you're describing it, it's a kind of a cautious approach where we look at activities and, and prohibitions from other departments or from regional board basin plans and apply those. But this permit is intended to allow other information to inform where prohibitions occur. So first off, with all MPDS permits, you have a five year permitting period after which the permit expires and needs to be renewed. And at that time, at a minimum, we would take into consideration any new information that we've received. We still have public comment period. I'm not aware that we've been provided site specific information yet. However, if we have, we would take that into consideration as well. And then I would also look to our council to describe whether or not we have an opportunity to modify the map during the, during the duration of the permit term. So during these five years, if we receive information two years from now on a study that suggests even though an, act, an area is currently prohibited, mining could occur there safely, is there a way that we could perhaps revise the maps through executive director approval or through board approval or something without revising a new permit? I'm not sure if there is an opportunity, but that's an approach that we sometimes take where we have pieces that can be interactively updated during the term of a permit. I would just remind the board that this is a workshop and that um, these are the kinds of questions and concerns we'll look into um, based on the comments and based on your comments and concerns. We don't have all the answers now. We're, we're looking to get input. Great. Okay, so that's helpful to, um, sounds like that's an area to, to, to continue to uh, refine or define. Um, I think, uh, you know, and, and just personally, I feel like, cause this is, um, you know, statewide and we never have perfect data um, and we're always trying to um, help develop more more data, we want to figure out how we continue to do that and then learn from that. Um, uh, and then, so my last question is just, there was a question um, that was, uh, you know, there were many questions that were uh, brought to the board um, on that were um, with our last speaker. Um, one was just, is it possible to get an exception? Um, and I just wonder if that's something that staff could clarify um, or, you know, it could be an area to help define as we move forward if um, if we don't have an answer now. Yes, this is Diana again. Um, so that comment kind of sparked me because um, in our NPS permit, our, our proposed permit, um, we're not proposing uh, providing any kind of exception of needing to go through the permitting process. Um, an exception would be something that would be outside of this permit process, mm -hmm. um, that if a miner would go come directly to the state board or a regional water board with a specific mining activity, a specific location, and it's not really termed an exception, it's basically would be some documentation in writing that a permit would not be needed for that activity. We really don't have anything to accept them from. Okay, and that's with the um, the regional boards that yes. they would work with. Okay. Okay, those are my questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Hi, uh, this is, sorry, Ryan Mallory Jones with the Office of Chief Counsel. I just wanted to add to what Diana said. Um, the exceptions, I think what's being referred to uh, are in SB 637, the Senate bill that created, uh, sort of kickstarted this whole permitting approach, um, says that in some situations, the regional boards can issue a letter saying that no permits required. And that essentially um, describes, because the definition of suction dredge mining is as broad as it is in the legislation, 
and because there are uh, you know potentially permutations of mining that fit into that that may not be <clears throat> excuse me um, regulable through the Clean Water Act or through our waste discharge requirement authorities. There may be situations where just a permit from the water boards isn't applicable or appropriate. Um, so we would be able to. Uh, and I think that would probably be a site specific regional board determination based on what the activity is and where it's taking place that no permit would be required. Um, and then that could be taken to DFW, Department of Fish and Wildlife, to finish the permitting process. Great, thank you. Thank you, board member. Um, one clarifying question, um, as I understand it, the, the current uh, status quo, if you will, uh, is a de facto ban in the state. Uh, so uh, is, is that correct? So currently uh, there aren't uh, suction dredge mining activities going on. Is that correct or am I incorrect in that? Uh, yes, this is Diane again. Um, yes, that is correct. It would take a permit or one of these regulating uh, mechanisms to um, move that, uh, that you call a ban is, um, well, moratorium. Yes. Support, yeah, um, support, yes. For yeah. any one activity. Right. So at this time, there is no such dredged mining, um, allowed in the state. Okay. That's helpful to, to understand the kind of currently, uh, Mr. Mallory Jones, anything to clarify there? Yeah. I just want to, sorry, <laughs> add one more thing. Um, Diane is correct, and uh, just an important, I think, note of clarification is that um, if this permit's adopted, however it's adopted, if there are um, areas that this permit does not allow suction dredge mining, um, that that's not necessarily the final word on suction dredge mining. The regional boards will be able to permit, and they could even um, you know, this isn't a basin plan amendment. The regional boards could permit suction dredge mining including in the watersheds that maybe this permit doesn't under different sets of conditions. So those prohibitions, those maps are relative to the specific conditions of the permit and the relatively conservative approach that this permit takes. And if the regional boards wanted to dial down on individual or regional permits, they may be able to actually lift the existing moratorium in those watersheds under different sets of conditions or for different forms of mining. Um, I see a couple of attendees with their hands up. Um, it's uh, Craig Tucker and Mr. Uh, Guardiola. Uh, I'll go ahead and allow them to provide, if they want to say a, a few follow up things. I, I would also provide an opportunity for Ms. Martin as well, only because um, I will say the video crossed a little bit of a personal line in accusing some impropriety in her receiving grants or whatnot. And, I uh, do want to make sure she has an opportunity to respond for herself in that. But um, start with uh, Mr. Guardiola. I think he had his his hand up first, and then we'll go back to Mr. Tucker and then uh, Ms. Martin. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, reiterate that, that we would go along with an extension on this process um, as we feel it really um, as laid out here is a continued ban on mining and doesn't uh, help the miners to get back or utilize the watersheds uh, or land that, that has been set aside for mining. So I wanted to, to make sure that uh, that that was heard. Um, and and also um, just to, um, um, you know, re thank you again for, for allowing us this opportunity and uh, remind you that we'll be putting in a uh, a formal uh, letter on this. Um, the other thing I really wanted to, to express is that, you know, it's important. We, we put a lot of uh, uh, value here in this meeting today of, uh, of cultures um, with, with indigenous people uh, and their land. Uh, we put uh, uh, value on, on environmental uh, standards you know, none of the miners disagree with those um, values, but we also have a value here and we have a value that's protected uh, with uh, the laws of our federal government and the California government. 
and we really feel those are being ignored here um, and not addressed. And we have some overextensions and some claims being made um, regarding law as well. And it's not uh, not a full uh, understanding of that law. And furthermore, I, I would recommend that and we've got a, a, a dredge pool that we can set up anywhere that, that you'd like us to do it. Uh, we'd be happy to rent a facility to do this. Set up a dredge so you guys can actually see, feel, and understand what kind of equipment and how small of scale it actually is. Um, we can do this, uh, you know, it's a 20 by 20 pool, and we can set it up just about uh, anywhere that we need to set it up. Because uh, before we start banning something, and, and I would invire, uh, invite not only uh, the, the water board, um, but uh, but Ms. Martin and uh, and anybody from the Crip tribe uh, to come out and uh, and maybe we can have a questions answer session based on the equipment we're talking about here today. Uh, it seems to me that everybody is looking at this humongous thing uh, that we're trying to do, and really it's a much smaller smaller uh, scale than, than most people uh, I think here believe. So I, I would like to to offer that service uh, to you guys to make sure that you understand what we're doing here. And that's all I have to say, except for, again, um, I think everybody here uh, regarding this would, would appreciate another extension on this because um, the questions weren't, weren't ans answered here, uh, nor did we really have enough time to really get into it. And it's kind of hard with Zoom meetings, I understand. All right, thank you, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Guardiola. And it's why I appreciate that you'll have more written comment and uh, it is important to completely document that way. This is one way where we receive uh, comment and, and discussion and do know that we'll we'll continue to follow up and, and that this is a workshop and exactly for this purpose. So look forward to your written comments. Um, uh, Mr. Tucker, uh, would you like to provide some further comment? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I just want to make two points uh, that your attorney did not make. And one is um, we purposefully were engaged in the legislative process uh, that created SB 637. And it's clear from the law that you also have the opportunity to simply decide that this cannot be permitted in such a way as to comply with the Clean Water Act. You're under no obligation to allow this activity to proceed. And there are other ways which people can mine their claims. So I just wanna be um, crystal clear on that point and make sure folks understood that. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Uh, Ms. Martin. Thank you, Chair and members of the board. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to respond a little bit to the um, information presented in the movie. Um, we've heard this, uh, this um, information before during the work of the section dredge bill going through the legislature. And I just wanna clarify, it's absolutely true. The Sierra Fund has spent many years developing what we call our headwater mercury source reduction program, trying to reduce the flow of mercury from our upper watershed down into the San Francisco Bay and Delta. One feature of that has been our work um, in, in talking about section dredge mining, but it's really a small piece, a much larger piece are two big projects, which I think are where the $14 million that the section dredgers were talking about. One of those was an $8 million general fund uh, uh, budget change proposal that Jerry Brown, Governor Brown approved in the budget year 2017-2018. And that money was used to assess uh, the problems we found at the state park up at Malakoff Diggins. Um, the Sierra Fund has been working up there for well more than 10 years with partners at USGS and the Forest Service and of course state parks, it's their property. And we've been helping them bring resources to that project. That $8 million went right to state parks budget it did not pass through the Sierra Fund's uh, hands in any way, and we haven't been paid a penny from that. 
The six million dollars of the remaining millions um, was a another project that we have championed for many many years by Nevada Irrigation District, which is struggling with reservoir sedimentation. Uh, the reservoir on the Bear River is filled with sediment that is contaminated with mercury. It's old hydraulic mining sediment still flowing into their reservoir and and making it uh, com compromise both its storage and especially its operational capacity. As part of that project, we did work with the irrigation district to get $6 million in the budget year 17-18, also um, from Prop 13 funding, to try to look at a way to reduce the discharge of mercury from that reservoir while also removing the material in the reservoir. And this is why we've gotten to be such experts at uh, how to deal with mercury contaminated sediment if you're trying to remove it from a reservoir we have great expertise in this. We've um, helped the water, uh, the irrigation district get all the permitting, the same permitting that the people getting gravel out of the Bear River, you heard those guys talking about. All of those people have Clean Water Act water quality permits as required, just like um, we're talking about here. But they've also had to do all the other things miners do, create a reclamation plan, put up financial assurances, um, allow annual inspections, and those kinds of activities are all being observed by these other sorts of activities. So I want to be clear that that $6 million also didn't go to the Sierra Fund, it went to the Nevada Irrigation District. This is, I think, a good example of information misconstrued and just straight up wrong. Uh, the Sierra Fund does have a small staff, seven people. One of them is a master, is a PhD, Dr. Monahan, who is an expert on real-time monitoring with mercury. Another is a master's degree uh, environmental scientist who did the real-time mercury under uh, monitoring um, as part of his research. So we are, are experts on this subject and I appreciate the opportunity to clarify the $14 million um, in question. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Uh, with that, I do see there is someone who uh, is under the name Kyocera E6910 that has their hand up. If you don't mind emailing uh, our clerk of the board, uh, Janine Townsend, at comment letters, C O M M E N T S letters at waterboards.ca.gov, we might be able to. Oh, you have your hand down now. Well, if you need to identify yourself and speak, uh, just let the uh, clerk of the board know. Uh, that brings us to uh, the the rest of the comment cards. It is 11:45. I want to be mindful we haven't taken a midday, you know, a mid morning break. Uh, we could take some public comment and then just have uh, go into lunch then, um, or you want to take a break now and then do a late lunch. How are my uh, fellow board members feeling? I would I'm I would take some I would take some comment now and then uh, go to lunch. Is my okay. Question. All right, then thank you for helping because I didn't want to make that alone. <laughs> okay, then uh, we will move. Uh, first, I, I'll go here to uh, Brandon Weathers with the Northern California Gold Prospectors uh, Group. Uh, Chair, this yes. is Billy from AGP Video. What, uh, what amount of time would you like on the public comment? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, let's uh, say, uh, one, one moment, let me give a quick count on how many folks we have. Oh, we have about, um, oh, uh, almost 30. Um, so let's say uh, three minutes and if folks need more, we can go from there. Does that seem fair? Um, you know, uh, uh, we can go above three, but we'll start at three and then we'll see how, how folks feel on, on the time from there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, Brandon uh, Weathers, I think is who we have here as our first. So we'll wait a moment for you to get set up here. Brandon, you may need to unmute yourself.
and Mr. Weathers may not be uh, currently at his desk, so we can um, move I on. I think he's got it. He, oh, he does? Okay. Somebody just unmuted. Okay, great. Mr. Weathers, I think, go ahead and try your audio. Getting any audio, sir. Okay. Um, Mr. Weathers, if you're having some technical difficulties, you should um, go ahead and try to email comment letters at uh, waterboards.ca.gov and uh, we can get you back in the queue here. Uh, next, we'll call up then uh, Caitlin Kalua with the California Coast Keeper Alliance. Um, Billy, she has a PowerPoint presentation. Wonderful. Okay, sorry, there's a little different format than previous hearings. So apologies for the delay. Oh, it's okay. Good to have you join us. Good morning. All right, wonderful. Thank you for having me. Um, very brief comments. I appreciate the time uh, to follow the panel this morning. Um, my name is Caitlin Kalua. I am the policy analyst with the California Coastkeeper Alliance, which represents local waterkeeper organizations throughout the state, which include um, areas and watersheds with uh, historic mining impacts as well as those who have um, witnessed section dredge and have had it had this activity in their watersheds in years past um, before this moratorium. So first I would like to echo the comments provided in this morning's panel panel that the on ongoing impacts of legacy mercury pollution in our waterways really can't be understated. The Federal Clean Water Act clearly prohibits the discharge of pollutants into waters of the US by any person from a point source except where that discharge is allowed under an NPDES permit. The water boards have an affirmative duty to protect the beneficial uses of our waterways for, the, for both the public and the environment, which include aquatic fish and wildlife, and ultimately have the authority to reject an NPDES permit and prohibit an activity where beneficial uses will be impacted beyond repair. Uh, next slide, please. I would like to zoom in here to this little triangle north of um, in the Northern Central Valley. This is located just south of the Uber River um, outside of Marysville that allows for section dredge mining to incur, uh, well, to incur under this NPDES permit um, in the map provided by your staff. Next slide, please. This is a watershed already impacted by historic mining, impacts that include legacy mercury pollution, arsenic and lead, as well as entirely altered stream courses. Just north of this green triangle here um, are the Yuba Goldfields, which are located along the Yuba River um, just outside of Marysville. And these gold fields have completely altered the course of the lower Yuba River and have are a leftover relic from the gold rush era. This is one of two rivers in the Central Valley where Chinook salmon spawn and is one of the only in the Central Valley that supports steelhead trout runs. Just east of this triangle is the Spenceville Wildlife Re Refuge, which also provides critical salmon spawning habitat. Next slide, please. For years, the South Yuba River Citizens League also known as Yuba River Waterkeeper, who, who I represent, has invested in habitat restoration in the lower Yuba River to increase populations of federally, federally listed Chinook salmon and steelhead trout. Essentially allowing suction dredge in this area has a potential to unravel years, if not decades, of investment to restore native salmon and, and address ongoing environmental harm from historic mining. We encourage staff to reconsider areas where an NPDES permit for suction dredge mining will be issued to consider the full ecosystem impacts, including aquatic and wildlife beneficial uses before allowing this outdated mining practice to take place. Next slide, please. The Uber River watershed is really only one example of a watershed that supports native salmon and other fish species that would be impacted by this activity. And we strongly consider your reconsideration of this permit. Um, in closing, <laughs> California salmon are at a critical tipping point and it really is unconscionable to tip the scales against them even further. So we thank you for the opportunity to comment and we look forward to submitting written comment um, during this public comment period. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Kalua. And uh, 
thank you for um, being right on three minutes as well. Uh, no, uh, much appreciated. Thank you for your comments. Uh, let me quickly pull up my speaker card here again. Uh, next up, I have here, um, and I've noticed that actually a good number of our commenters uh, have uh, re uh, reflected that they only need speak if uh, necessary. So I've gone ahead and group those that actually have a firm request to speak here. So it's a smaller subset. And uh, first up here, we have Minnie Carter from uh, the independent, uh, who's an independent miner. Um, Chair Esquivel, I don't see Minnie on the list. Is she not in, is she not in the room? Okay, well, uh, Ms. Carter, if you're viewing from uh, the web stream, uh, please do, um, there is a link to be able to request to get into the Zoom meeting on the agenda, but, oh, and or you can email uh, comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov if you're having some challenges getting in. Um, next then is, uh, would be James Rankin from SMPA. You got him. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we yes we can. Okay, I'm sorry, but my comments may be closer to five minutes. I hope I'm allowed to continue. Yeah, uh, we'll go ahead and set it at five uh, now for you, so as to okay. not be interrupted. Then, thank you. Okay, my name is James Rankin. I'm the president of the French Colts Mining District, northwest west of Redding, California. I'm also the legislation chairman for the Shasta Miners and Prospectors Association, and I hold three federal mining claims in California. I've been actively involved in this draft dredging permit process since I attended the public meeting held in Reading in 2017 at which I presented comments. I have attended three meetings with the water board staff in Sacramento during the development of this draft proposal along with frequent correspondence regarding this subject. I have found the water board staff to be helpful and honest in my dealings with them. They have listened to my comments and concerns and addressed many questions that I had regarding this process. However, as a representative of the aforementioned groups, I must strongly disagree with the proposed draft in its entirety. It is a ban on all small scale mining in California disguised as a permit process. Much uh, attention has been given to the mappings. That's not really necessary. The descriptive narrative of the areas close to mining preclude any areas that are practical for mining uh, from a permit. The former water board director, Thomas Howard in 2000 wrote 2013 wrote to Fish and Wildlife Director Charlton Bonham. This letter was regarding such and dredging. He stated, we recommend that the existing moratorium be continued indefinitely or this activity be permanently prohibited. I've asked the water board staff if a revised policy or position of the water board exists. I was informed there has not been any new policy statement. It certainly appears that this position is still in effect. In these draft regulations, there is no reasonable differentiation in the requirements, fees, and reporting recognizing scope. There is a vast difference between the effects of a four or six inch dredge and a small one and a half or two inch dredge. The smaller dredges are only capable of processing small amounts of material and only able to reach shallow depths, yet they are treated the same. When I read the reporting requirements in the draft regulations, I fail to see how most miners would be able to complete them without errors. This leaves them vulnerable to civil lawsuits by private organizations. These requirements read as if they are for a large commercial operation with a staff of lawyers to prepare such documents. Small scale miners or private individuals, mom and pop operations, without the resources to meet these complicated requirements. This brings up my next point. The revised definition of dredging in SB 637 is the use of mechanized or motorized system for the removal or assisting in the removal of or the processing of materials from the bed bank or channel of a river, stream or lake in order to recover minerals. It further notes, it is unlawful to possess a vacuum or suction dredge in areas or within 100 yards of waters that are closed to the use of a vacuum or suction dredge. This provision has gone so far as to criminalize many people who have their mining equipment in storage at their home. 
a shop vacuum in your home or garage could be a citable offense. This draft permit only addresses and effectively prohibits suction dredging as it was defined before Senate Bill 637. According to the background information contained in the draft, there were a maximum of 3,200 suction dredge permits before the moratorium. Your clerk of the board is in possession of a letter opposing this proposal. It is endorsed by many small scale mining organizations representing well over 100,000 individual miners. There are many other small scale miners that are not members of an organization that have not been counted in this letter. The majority of these miners possess and use the other mining equipment that has now been improperly called a dredge and no longer allowed without a water board permit. This draft does not provide a path to permit the use of this equipment or these mining methods. It only addresses true in-stream dredging. This is less than 3% of the miners now affected by this lengthy process. Under this draft, at least 97% of the small scale miners are still without a permit path to resume small scale mining. The Bureau of Land Management has a long history of managing mining on public lands. They recognize the self-limiting scope of these other small scale mining methods that are restricted to non-motorized excavation methods. This keeps the scale small. The BLM does not require a permit for such methods and under BLM 43 CFR 3809.5 classifies this as casual use with no permitting required. I urge the water board to implement a similar program for these other mining methods without such or a letter of waiver, they have been effectively banned. According to the BLM Sacramento office, there are currently 33,000 mining claims in California. In addition, there are many other patented mining properties that are private property. This proposed permit draft results in these mining claims and properties being regarded as nearly worthless since the economic basis of their value is the ability to recover the minerals on these claims. By preventing mining methods that are necessary for the economical recovery of these minerals, these owners have had a very significant taking of their property values. There are a few studies cited in these draft regulations as a basis for the total exclusion of any gold bearing streams from areas open to obtaining a, a permit. There were a number of studies provided to the water board by the mining community during this process that showed benign or minimal effects from dredging. None of these studies were cited in this draft. A fair process that did not have any predetermined outcome as a goal would have considered and cited other scientifically valid information that may not have been in line with a preconceived narrative. It has been 11 years since suction dredging was allowed and four years since the other motorized or mechanized forms of mining were prohibited. Most of the aquatic, aquatic organisms that have elevated mercury levels have a short lifespan. Multiple generations of them have lived and died since the moratorium. If the narrative in the permit background information that mercury accumulation in aquatic or organisms is a result of historic mining with the mercury deeply buried in the immobile sediments and the redistribution by modern mining is the cause of elevated mercury tissue levels, a decrease in these tissue values should be evident since the moratorium. It is not. This is because the effects of atmospheric deposition are being ignored. The narrative that is all about mining. This cannot explain recent studies of mountain lions in the Santa Cruz mountains. This study shows high levels of mercury in these terrestrial predators. It is attributed to atmospheric deposition. The mountain lions that live in the coastal fog zone have significantly higher levels attributed to outgassing of mercury from the Pacific Ocean and deposited by the frequent fog. Mr. Rankin, I, I apologize, but um, I did give you five minutes and you're going a little over. If you don't mind uh, trying to um, wrap up some of your comments here, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I've, I've got about a half a paragraph left, if that's all right. Okay, that works. Thank you, sir. The majority of the atmospheric deposition of mer mercury is a result of the burning of fossil fuels, much of it from offshore sources in China. People ask, why is there mercury released from fossil fuels? These fossil fuels are the result of accumulation of plants and animals that were deposited hundreds of millions of years ago. Why do they have mercury to be released upon burning? 
It is because bioaccumulation of mercury has been taking place since life began on Earth. It did not begin with the mining of gold in California. It will not end with the prohibition of mining in California. It is disingenuous to act as if small-scale mining is the source. However, it is proving that small-scale mining removes the vast majority of any mercury encountered. Thank you for the opportunity to express my thoughts regarding this. Thank you, Mr. Rankin. I appreciate uh, you taking the time today to provide them. Next. I have a, uh, sorry, Chair Esquivel. I have a, just a follow-up question on one of the points that um, the last speaker asked. Um, I just wonder, and I'm wondering if staff can clarify um, that, you know, my understanding of the comment, one of the many points in those comments was um, that, you know, most of the um, small scale um, uh, miners don't, aren't covered under this in most of their activities and that it's not clear what the permit pathway is. Um, and you know, I, I, I guess um, just want to make sure I understand uh, how staff sees that um, and what sort of a pathway is that's um, possible on that. Uh, Mr. Bishop, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I'll jump in real quick. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, the, the permit is for discharges to uh, waters of the U.S. So if there's no discharge to waters of the U.S., that permit can't, it doesn't apply to them. So I agree that there are, um, are small-scale operations and large-scale operations that don't have a discharge to waters of the U.S. and they can't be covered under this permit. Um, and so if they are not causing an impact to water quality, surface or groundwater quality, um, they may well not need a permit, but they need to describe that um, that operation so that, that they can get that release. And they would do that with the regional boards? That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, board member. Uh, next, we have Glenn Spain uh, with the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, and I do have a small si a slide presentation. I would like five minutes if that's possible. And yes. I'll be yes. succinct. We'll, 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 yes, we'll, we'll fault you to five minutes here. Thank you. My name is Glenn Spain. I'm the Northwest Regional Director for the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations, PCFFA. We are the major trade associations for commercial fishing families, many of them salmon fishing, uh, fishing families, who make their living uh, uh, harvesting salmon for the market and for many communities up and down the coast. There are thousands of jobs that depend on healthy salmon runs. There are uh, literally tens to hundreds of millions of dollars at risk when those salmon runs collapse or when they are uh, uh, jeopardized by habitat losses or habitat destruction as we see often uh, in many river systems today. Now suction dredge mining contributes to that. It's not by any means the only impact, but it certainly contributes. And there is also, as you see for next slide, a basic incompatibility. The suction dredge systems are made, they're designed to suck up river bottom gravel that salmon need to spawn and rear in. That means that there is an inherent incompatibility between this particular particular form of recreational mining and the um, industrial needs, if you will, of uh, the California fishing industry, uh, as well as the uh, Oregon fishing in industry, because many of the uh, salmon that are caught in Oregon, some five, uh, some something like fifty percent, originate in California river systems. Next slide, please. Next slide. Now, I won't go into all of the difficulties. Uh, many other speakers have already gone into in great detail the difficulties 
that the adverse impacts that suction dredging can create on fragile in-stream spawning and rearing habitat, particularly in the seasons where the eggs are being laid. But I want to point out that what we are doing in this uh, uh, coastwide is trying to restore a lot of these river systems. Tens of millions of dollars of taxpayer money every year and uh, millions of dollars of our own money through the California stamp program, uh, salmon stamp program that our industry raises uh, go to habitat restoration. These are the same habitats that are being subsidized for destruction. This program has never even paid for itself and couldn't under the permit um, uh, conditions that are proposed pay for even its own enforcement. So we are using taxpayer money to subsidize the destruction of public resources that other taxpayer money is then going to try to uh, re restore. This as a policy doesn't make any sense. It's one of many good economic reasons for limiting at least and potentially banning this form of, of uh, stream use. Next slide. The impact of course is on ESA listed and uh, remember co salmon are both ESA and California ESA listed in most places. These are streams that are potentially impacted by suction dredging. They are not in, uh, insignificant in terms of uh, their stream reach. Um, but in addition, uh, next slide. There are also fall Chinook, which is not ESA listed, and I'll talk about the Klamath because the Klamath is a particular uh, interest. And uh, by the way, the uh, other particular problem with the suction dredge systems are not that any individual dredge is a, a, a serious problem, but cumulatively, it is a problem in many river systems, particularly in the Klamath. One of the prior speakers quoted that there are 33,000 mining claims in California. The impact, cumulative impact can be great. When the numbers are low, we are closed down and the numbers can be low because of habitat loss easily. In the Klamath, we've had several closures and those closures are coastwide. Next slide, please. Because salmon from the Klamath go both up uh, and, uh, north and far south their intermingled stocks and under weak stock management obligations, the fisheries managers have to close down these fisheries. We've seen several um, uh, uh, time periods where we've had major closures and that, next slide, means that suction dredging contributes to the loss of these fisheries and can be the last straw in some cases to trigger a closure. That can mean as many as 100 to 200 million dollars a year in economic losses for coastal communities and the loss of hundreds if not thousands of jobs coastwide. So it is not a benign impact. It is an economic impact on our industry. And I'll close with that. We will, of course, follow up with written comments. Thank you. Really appreciate the comments today. Next, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to call up Alan uh, Gallegos, who's with the USDA Forest Service. And just for good process, uh, flag that uh, Jeremiah Osgood will be followed uh, by Mr. Uh, Gallegos, followed by uh, John Reisman. And I think at that point, we will uh, take a, a lunch break. Chair sure, Esquivel, I don't see Mr. Gallegos is on the list. Okay. Or, or is in the attendee. So Jeremiah would be the next individual. Yep, Jeremiah Osgood then. Thank you. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, I I'd like to bring up a couple points that that I that I've heard. So just this gentleman was bringing up about there's 33,000 mining claims. Those 33,000 mining claims, and the the point of bringing up the salmon and the steelhead and these other fishes, I would like to say that almost 90 percent of the mining claims in California have none of those fish. Okay, so these fish aren't too much of a problem when it comes to the rest of the mining claims that aren't near the salmon spawning areas. 
So the previous suction dredge regulations by the Department of Fish and Game or Department of Wildlife now, there were certain clauses. You could only use a certain size nozzle in the stream during certain times of the year when the fish weren't spawning. Now I understand that uh, people are worried about the destruction of the stream bed. So we are not allowed to dredge according to the previous regulations anytime during these spawning seasons, okay? And then any hole that we can create with a four inch dredge, which I live in Nevada now, but I am a shareholder in mining claims in California. A four inch dredge cannot do the amount of destruction that you guys are, are, are talking about. We have to get real about this. A four inch dredge, the whole a four inch dredge can make will be filled in by any winter flood or storm event. Now, Shannon Poe brought up about winter storms. When we have these winter storm events that move rocks the size of VW buses, do you think that is not actually moving? You call elemental mercury or mercury or toxic levels. It, it, it's just ridiculous to me that we're even talking about these things and attacking suction dredging like it, it's like, like like it's a major contributor to, to, to these events that you're speaking of. Now, you want to talk about toxicity and pollution. Now, you've got boats on every reservoir pretty much in California. All these rivers that we dredge, all this water runs down into these reservoirs. You have gas stations on the reservoirs in the lakes that are actually polluting these environments. The water that you drink comes from places where people are crapping in outhouses on top of the reservoir, boats that are drunk dumping water out of their bilge pumps into the reservoir. I don't even see why this is such a... a, a, a You're, you're attacking a very small industry that literally puts money in people's pockets. Gold is $2,000 an ounce right now. We are in, a, we, we, we're, we're in this COVID, and with this COVID, there's not a lot of money going around. I, I was laid off four months ago, and I still can't find a job. If I was able to suction dredge right now, I could be making an... And I, I, I would just like to state that there's a moratorium, but why... What, what what was wrong with the Department of Fish and Games regulations before? And and was the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the USDA, the Forest Service and the BLM, were they wrong for all of these decades until now? And, and, and now we're just all of a sudden polluters? Where where are you guys at with what used to happen? And now all of a sudden we're demonized. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Osgood. I appreciate your comments today and your, your feedback here uh, during the workshop. Uh, next, we have uh, John Reisman from uh, South Fork Adventure Company. Just wanted to say my name is John Reisman and I, uh, I'm a small miner and school teacher. Um, I want to thank the board members, the panels and the concerned parties for all of their input today. Uh, mining is a historic activity in California. Um, from my experience, it's been a healthy recreational hobby uh, for lots of children, families, and communities. Uh, from my experience, mining has never caused any pollution in my particular area other than historic pollution that we have been cleaning up, obviously, on a grand scale as a community and as a group, um, including members of the, the different panels and the different parties. Um, I don't believe there is a discharge into the river. I do believe, uh, much like Mr. Osgood stated, that many times during winter storms, the water literally boils. Everything in the river bed load to the bedrock moves. That's the way rivers um, kind of create their erosion and deposition process throughout the years. I don't believe that uh, anything is actually added to the water column. Um, I do believe that it's actually healthy for fish. Um, I swim in the rivers all the time. I spend a lot of time out on the river doing, you know, habitat restoration um, and recreational activities. I believe in general, overall, the river quality and the water quality is improved by the, the recreational uses today. I think many people go to the rivers today uh, and look at them differently than they did. 
I think that, uh, like Mr. Osgood stated, that many of the rivers that we're talking about don't have salmon populations. The salmon populations haven't run for 90 and 100 years. The dams have created situations in which uh, the rivers don't run wild. They're dead. Um, they run from dam to dam. They can only allow a certain amount of discharge and, and input to, to, to remain within the specifications of the different dams. And I think that uh, in general, we're using uh, the exception and not the rule here. Um, there are certain places that obviously suction dredging may need to be limited in its scope and circumstance and size. But with regard to the majority of the rivers that we're talking about, in the state of California on the mining claims in question, salmon is not the issue. Water quality is not the issue. I really appreciated Mr. Osgood's comments about the, the reservoirs and the activities that are going on in the reservoirs. Because when I, when I drive over the bridges and the, and the lakes and the, and the areas that I live in in the reservoirs, it appears that there is, it, it, it's, it's almost disgusting to see the amount of garbage and waste that are discharged into our reservoirs today. I think that we're looking in the wrong places to solve the right problem. And I believe that overall we need to allow this process to play out in a fair and equitable way for all parties. Um, I just appreciate everybody's time and energy. Thank you. I hope we can bring back suction dredging in the right way um, in a responsible manner. Thank you. I appreciate your your comments and contributions, uh, Mr. Reisman. And you know, would just flag that all those other uh, sources of pollution are of critical concern to the regional boards and the state board, and subject to other programs and discussions. Um, so we don't uh, pursue this at the exclusion of needing to continue to make sure that those other discharges and impacts to water quality are are continued to 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 be addressed. So. Uh, but appreciate your your comments as well, though. So thank you. Um, with that, it, that is the extent of those that indicated um, that they wanted to affirmatively speak on the list. I do have uh, what is still about uh, uh, 20 folks or so um, that uh, have indicated that they will only speak if necessary. Um, I can start to, to run through those after we take our lunch here. We'll take a 30-minute lunch at 12.30, come back at 1. Um, but um, trying to figure out if there's a way for those of you within, again, that indicated speak only if necessary, if there's a way, um, if you are wanting to speak, to kind of get you to the, the front of our list. What I would recommend maybe is, oh, Mr. Wiles, I see you popping up, but maybe uh, email comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov and just maybe uh, flag in the affirmative if you'd really like to uh, provide comment uh, after, when we come back from lunch. Um, and that way, hopefully, you know, we can kind of make sure that we're getting folks that are actually wanting to speak here and not spending too much time hitting folks that uh, don't necessarily uh, wish to at this point. Uh, Mr. Wiles, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, actually, Chair uh, Escavel, we do have an updated list, which we'll be transmitting to you during the break right now. So if there are additional people who are on and believe that they identified that they do want to speak, we'll pick them up when we resume. And then, as as uh, the chair just said, anybody else who previously identified as speak only if necessary, an email to uh, the clerk at comment letters would work um, in addition we might, if you haven't spoken yet and you do want to say something toward the end, you could also use the raise hand feature. Great. Thank you, Mr. Wiles. Um, with that, we'll give us a, a 30 minute lunch here to take a break. Um, really appreciate everyone's uh, good contributions to the workshop and discussion so far this morning. We still have more and um, I'll give us uh, 30 minutes and change. And so uh, plan to come back at one o'clock uh, on the spot. That works for everyone. Uh, those of you already in the Zoom platform, um, I know it's easier to just uh, keep your, your window on, you know, keep yourself muted, your, your camera off, so that, uh, but that way we don't have to re-enter you uh, here uh, later on. So uh, with that, we'll see everyone at one o'clock. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hope everyone had a good lunch. Uh, Chair Esquivel, this is Phil Wiles. Uh, just a quick note. Mm -hmm. We just emailed to you an updated speaker list. OK. And okay. the clerk is just returning to the room right now. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I opened. I have it list. I have the list here. And I quickly sorted by those still uh, wishing to affirmatively speak or at least indicate it on the list. So looks like I have a tranche of one, two, three, four, about five folks here that um, at least, again, have indicated at this point they'd wish to speak. And then we'll start going through and just double checking with those who just uh, said speak if necessary. So I'll give a moment for uh, the clerk to get seated here. But um, we'll start with Warren Young. And uh, who will be followed by uh, Stephen Evans uh, from the California Wilderness Coalition. Uh, Chair Esquivel, I don't think that Warren is actually attending okay. right now. So we'll go to Stephen Evans. Yes, Stephen Evans from California Wilderness Coalition, then who will be followed uh, afterwards by John Buckley and Sarah uh, Hersby from CSERC. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thanks for taking the time to listen to and consider my testimony. My name is Steve Evans. and I'm the Wild Rivers Director for the California Wilderness Coalition. Uh, many newer board members may be surprised by the mining proponents claim that science doesn't support regulation. So it's worth at least summarizing some of the science that has documented the adverse impacts of suction dredge mining. First of all, suction dredge mining does release mercury into the river environment. The Water Board's own 2005 study found that suction dredge mining discharged, quote, mercury concentrations in the fine and suspended sediment at more than 10 times higher than that needed to classify it as hazardous waste. According to the American Fisheries Society, scientific studies document the adverse biological and physical effects suction dredge mining can have on stream geomorphology, habitats, and aquatic orga organisms. Suction dredge mining operations in historically mined waterways also have the potential to mobilize legacy mercury, leading to the bioaccumulation of methylmercury in fishes and mussels that are consumed by humans. According to now retired UC Davis professor, Dr. Peter Moyle, quote, suction, dredge, suction dredging represents a chronic unnatural disturbance of habitats supporting fish that are already likely to be stressed by other factors. In regard to the claim that small suction dredges have minimal impacts, I invite you to please view the slides I presented at the Water Board workshop held in Sacramento in 2017. They show multiple suction dredges channelizing more than 100 yards of the lower East Fork St. Gabriel River, despite the fact that the river is critical habitat for the threatened native fish, the Santa Ana sucker. In regard to the now infamous maps, I'm pleased to hear that the Water Board intends to work on those. Uh, the practical impact of unreadable maps is that regulations will be unenforceable. The map should be improved so they're readable and easily understandable and supported by a narrative list of watersheds where mining is allowed, limited, or prohibited. The improved maps and narrative lists should be made available for review and comment by the public before the order is finalized by the board. Uh, Cal Wild strongly supports uh, sections 4.3.3. 4.5 and 4.6, which prohibits section dredge mining in uh, uh, rivers impaired by metals that are on the 303D list. Uh, rivers that have a history of gold mining and therefore are likely to be mercury impaired and rivers and watersheds where mercury is detected in fish tissues but may not, may not yet be declared to be impaired. We do have an issue with section 4.4, which basically prohibits uh, discharges into water bodies subject to year-round prohibition on suction dredge mining and so-called Class A watersheds per the Department of Fish and Wildlife's regulations. Unfortunately, the CD, uh, CDFW regs allow uh, uh, allow uh, mining in federally protected areas. It's worth noting the EPA closed federally protected areas, national wild and scenic rivers, in endangered species habitat areas uh, to suction dredge mining. Uh, the Water Board's order should be revised to close these federally protected areas and also 
state protected areas, including state parks, state wild and scenic rivers and state heritage and wild trout streams. And then closing on enforcement, there's no point to establish regulations if there is no enforcement. The draft order does not address how these regulations will be enforced. It's not clear to me that the water board or the regional boards have enforcement staff in the field. Perhaps the water board is hoping that CDFW wardens can provide enforcement, but each CDFW warden is responsible for patrolling an average of 480 square miles of the state. The final order must have a workable and fully funded enforcement provision. I'll be submitting written comments. And again, thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mr. Evans. I appreciate the, the comments. Next, uh, we have John Buckley and Sarah uh, with uh, CSERC. Uh, and I see Sarah uh, Husby is, is, or Husby is here as well. <clears throat> I don't know if you wanted to uh, take it as a panel or just have individual time, but. Uh, Chair Esquivel. Uh, yes. Um, Sarah is no longer needing to speak. <clears throat> okay. Um, and is that the case for Mr. Buckley as well? No. Uh, good afternoon. No, good okay. Great. Yeah. And I would ask for five minutes. Um, we decided that I just would handle what Sarah was going to cover. Perfect. And I can deal with it in less than five minutes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, five minutes. <laughs> and you know what? Uh, just a flag at this point. Uh, I think everyone has pretty much uh, used or had about five minutes. So we'll just. My three minutes at the beginning uh, thought of for public comment is five minutes is probably just more appropriate for folks uh, going forward as well. So anyway, just a flag for our uh, thank you. technicians. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mr. Buckley, you can begin. Yeah. So good afternoon. I've been involved with this issue for more than 20 years. Um, I served in the past on the state section dredging stakeholder committee and our center provided highly detailed comments on the fish and wildlife dredging plan in the past. Uh, I served in the, with the U.S. Forest Service for many years as a firefighter and fire prevention officer, and during that time, I frequently checked camps of suction miners along the South Fork Stanislaus River. And during those times, I observed gas cans balanced on rocks out on the river. I observed times when there was trash all along the riverbanks, and at times when the entire river was returned to muddy sludge as the dredgers vacuumed the river bottom and use pry bars to dislodge rocks and to crumble sections of the banks into the river. So my experience from years of observing suction dredging showed that suction dredging is consistently the exact opposite of water quality. And it's illogical for the board to consider intentionally permitting an activity that will infuse sediment in the streams and rivers and often at high levels, and that can result in tadpoles, minnows, and other sensitive aquatic species being suctioned in the hoses and run through a sluice box, all to allow a non-essential recreational activity that some number of folks are strong ad advocates for. But if water quality and sensitive aquatic resources are a priority, my testimony or my input is that this permit should not move forward to approval. And as in the presentations earlier today, your staff was assuming that water impacts can be minimized because the permit has requirements to describe equipment or to name the site to be worked and to complete a best management practice form. With all due respect, if you really think about it, that is mostly meaningless unless there's good enforcement, which has been put forward by a number of presenters. Even with fees, the Water Board or State Fish and Wildlife will have insufficient staff available to do widespread on-site effective enforcement. Dredging is often done at sites in narrow river drainages that are screened from view by dense stands of alders, willows, and other riparian vegetation. It can be hard to monitor. In addition, many discharge prohibitions are truly not enforceable. And if no one is listening to the rest of what I'm sharing, think of this next part. Telling a miner to stop dredging if fish and wildlife eggs are observed is a joke. It's not going to happen. Expecting a miner to stop if turbidity levels 500 feet downstream are visually higher than upstream would mean in most cases that miners can't even work. Such good intended rules won't be followed when it comes to real life application out there along the river. The water board cannot just hope that most miners with permits will responsibly self-regulate. In countless situations, you know that won't happen. 
and a permit that cannot be effectively enforced makes a mockery of the system. So as already has been mentioned to add frustration for those of us who serve as watchdogs for water, the water board hasn't provided any accurate map that actually shows in our South Central region of the Sierra Nevada, whether it's the Tuolumne River upper segments or Stanislaus River or the Clark Fork or, or these other areas, you can't tell from the map what's actually being proposed to be allowed for dredging. Worse, a spreadsheet list was circulated supposedly from the water board that included stream and river segments in Yosemite Park and National Forest Wilderness and other places where it's actually illegal for suction dredging to occur. So just assuming those were wrong, it's look, we're looking for the good maps that will help us understand where there's proposed act, uh, activity. Last, this process needs to at least be extended until the public can have a fair opportunity to see such high quality maps and to read accurate text identifying which stream segments could have dredging allowed. So in closing, I urge that the board should not approve a permit system that has low potential to be consistently and effectively enforced because there's no question that the reauthorization of suction dredging will result in significant impacts to water resources. And honestly, that is not the goal of the board or of those of us who rely on the board to represent us. So thank you, I appreciate the time to share. I'll be glad to answer questions or submit in writing. Thank you, much appreciated, Mr. Buckley. Uh, next we have uh, Patrick Copelle from the uh, Tuolumne River Trust. Uh, Chair Esquivel, he's not listed as an attendee. Oh, okay. And in fact, I believe that we've now heard from everybody who indicated that they definitely yes. wanted to speak. Yes, uh, that, that is the case. And so uh, <clears throat> at this point, uh, if you haven't spoken and you are looking to do so and you are on the Zoom platform with us, um, uh, please do raise your hand. I think you can uh, raise your hand here on the platform. Um, otherwise, I will assume um, it was unnecessary for uh, the rest of the folks listed here to, um, to provide comment. So I see um, Mr. Hoagland, who uh, has previously uh, provided comment. Uh, Mr. Ben Wilbur, uh, though, is a new commenter. So Mr. Wilbur, and um, uh, you would be up next. And Mr. Hoagland, I will provide you a, a brief moment for, for follow-up if it looks like uh, you're looking to provide some. Mr. Wilbur, the microphone's open for you. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to make a comment about the fact that um, the regulations were based, or the proposed regulations anyway, seem to be based on some studies of the Yuba River and specifically a very high mercury um, sediment near the uh, opening of one of the creeks there. Um, I personally looked at some mercury data um, that was collected by the USGS on the south fork of the Yuba River. What I was trying to do was figure out if any of that um, was collected during the dredge season that was allowed under the pre-2019 regulations by the Department of Fish and Game. And there were dates for both uh, mercury levels collected at that site, which is the USGS 1141750 South Yuba River at the Jones Bar, North Grass Valley, California. Um, and there were uh, over a hundred recordings <clears throat> of mercury levels over a period of about three years at that spot. During the season for dredging and during the season of off dredging, there was no statistically significant difference in the level of mercury in the water collected at that site. Um, so to me, if there are hundreds or even tens of people dredging above that point, 
the level of mercury from the predictions um, stated in the proposed or the draft regulations should show that the level of mercury would be 10 times or even 100 times greater during the dry season than during off season, um, which was not the case. In fact, like I stated, there's basically no statistical difference between the measurements. Um, the other thing that I would like to state is that uh, the proposed draft, as I'm sure others have already stated, uh, used a map that was very difficult to determine. Um, I would ask that the board make subsequent maps available in a form that can be used in mapping software like a shapefile or a DWG or something like that. And also <clears throat> wanted to state that approximately of the sites available for mining, that only about 2% of them were located in an area that would be um, allowed for dredging under the proposed regulation. And that 98% of the sites where there's been any interest in mining for gold are prohibited under the proposed regulations, thus making this not a proposed permit, but more a proposed prohibition of suction dredging. So, um, Basically, I'm hoping that the new maps will be made available in a digital format that can be more easily adapted to study um, because the current map I basically had to try and reproduce by hand um, using the WUC10 um, watershed map as a base, um, which proved to be very time consuming. But anyway, with that, I would just like to say that I would like to do suction dredging. So um, I want to make that clear. And also that I do not believe that there's any scientific basis, even with available data, for prohibiting it based on its mercury emissions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilbur. Appreciated. Um, and yes, uh, I, I think um, several board members, I think we've, we've each highlighted, we have a desire to ensure that uh, we have a higher resolution map available for everybody here soon. And I believe uh, Mr. Phil Crater from our staff has indicated that'll, that'll be the case. So um, we'll get, um, as we wrap up here, uh, hearing from folks, we'll have a little back and forth here and perhaps have an opportunity to hear what the anticipated timeline might be for uh, getting the shape files out and, and helping folks have a, a higher granular understanding of where uh, the proposed uh, prohibitions and otherwise are. So thank you. Um, I will, uh, again, Mr. Uh, Oglin, uh, you had an opportunity earlier. I usually don't circle back and uh, allow necessarily follow up at, at this point, but uh, since uh, you do have your hand raised, I, I will, if you'd like to make some brief addition and comment um, allow you to do so if you'd like. And I'm not sure if you should have an opportunity to unmute yourself here in a moment, Mr. Hoagland. I'm not sure how that happened. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I believe I'm unmuted now. Yes, yes, you are. Hello. Okay, thank good you. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, allowing me a second opportunity. And I would like to express my thanks to the board for jumping on the idea of, of uh, fixing the maps to make them more legible. The uh, During my presentation or my questions, and I, and I do apologize, my understanding that this was for questions and comments, uh, but I did raise uh, one comment concerning the 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 exceptions with the letter 
from the regional from the regional boards. And I do have one question that I believe could be answered immediately in this in this forum is that if I were to apply for the letter or ask for the letter, would I still be held within the areas within the order? Thank you, Mr. Hoagland. Was that is um, just to uh, then uh, wrap up further? Is that the only uh, follow up question you have? Yes, sir. And yes, sir. We'll, yes. We'll okay, perfect. No. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Hoagland. Uh, and uh, Mr. Bishop, uh, I saw you uh, pop on or Mr. Wiles, if you'd like to try to answer that it seems reasonable question. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So I believe this was mentioned previously by, by Ryan Mallory Jones, but uh, this particular permit is one of the permitting options available for minors. Uh, the prohibition does apply if you're asking for permission to mine under the this particular permit, uh, but other uh, other opportunities would exist. Those would just be handled under individual permitting by the regional water boards. And then uh, if I can, we have one of the uh, folks who had identified a, a request to speak but was not attending has now jumped on and is an attendee and that's mr young if you'd like to hear from him chair Scavell. Oh, thank you for that flag mr wiles um and hopefully mr hogan uh hoglan rather sorry that was uh, a, a appropriate response for you so thank, thank you. you uh and i think the i think the the key there is the discussion here is for a general permit and this is uh, covering uh, what we understand are recreational uh, activities etc and that there are other permitting paths um, at the re regional level that uh, if there is you know, again someone looking to engage in these activities uh, would would maybe more appropriately kind of fall under if it's less recreational perhaps or less again appropriate for the general sort of guidelines of what is uh, being proposed here in the general order. Um, okay, uh, with that, um, let me, it was Mr. Uh, Young. Yes, Mr. Warren Young, um, would you uh, like to, to speak now? Uh, yes. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> yeah, good, good afternoon. Well, thank you. I'm I've been raised in California most of my life, and I I, I got raised dredging around the bake oven or uh, out of right out of Forest Hill in the American River area. And I can tell you, I got very fond memories of my dad, which is not here no more. Um, but we uh, we learned how to, uh, he taught me how to dredge. It was something that was kind of like a family thing. And then my cousin and uh, and. Uh, and I, and I, to this day, now I'm 64, um, and since the moratorium, it's for somebody like me, I've been retired for a few years now, and I have a five-inch dredge here right now, and I'm about ready to put it in the water. I've, I haven't had it in the water for three years, and, and when I do dredge, uh, that's a mid-sized dredge. It's a little bigger than most use. Uh, but it has a four inch nozzle. So that's pretty much accepted, especially here in Colorado. And most of the people use about a three inch. And like was said earlier, um, the, the discharge uh, is very minimal, especially you look at springtime runoff and all that. I mean, uh, like the president of the American Mining Association there said, that um, and you can watch the rivers and hear the rocks clink and all the gravels moved all the way down the bedrock. And uh, what a, a dredger does um, now, I seen a, a few dredgers there in that area. I was talking about the American River, and there, there's not enough people doing it to cloud up the river. Um, and by the proposal of the, the people there that um, are doing the uh, how do you say it, the NSDS or uh, <clears throat> those permits? I think they're on to something, trying to take care of um, the dredger uh, and being aware of uh, they could uh, they could in the water board themselves. Um, I've 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 checked in Wyoming. I've checked in uh, 
everywhere else. I think the water board uh, could do a regional thing. I checked in with the water board everywhere I go, and they, they always tell me they're happy uh, to hear from me. Most people don't check in, and they give me permission to go ahead and dredge. Now, um, there is, uh, what, 800 permits uh, a year at the most um, uh, that people that would like to apply, and a few out-of-state people like me, I would love to, I mean, I would love to go back for a few months in the summer, which is, you got to remember, dredging is only allowed for three or four or five months. And it's only, it's not a full-time year-round thing. Um, and enough studies have been done. And like the president said, we do remove, uh, I can tell you how much junk. And uh, as far as mercury, um, American River has its, its share, but... Um, you you know you don't really see it it's not uh something that's so prevalent that you're going to just throw a bunch of mercury out there um the gold sometimes has a little on it but um generally and uh, you you just really don't see that that much but like he said in certain areas like you the president said you can gather 240 pounds if well we can do a service and we do do a service and I can tell you that the fish really like to eat um, the the disturbances sometimes. But once you get through the silt, you're down in gravel and you don't make near as much um, disturbance. And like maybe 50, 20 feet behind you, like a couple years ago here in the Dolores River, I, I was amazed that the, there was silt down there, but uh, right after a little bit, uh, there was hardly anything coming out of there. The water looked clear. Um, you know, so it just depends on, on what kind of river you're in. But, uh, I mean, those areas that already have been designated by your studies and the proposed um, uh, permit situation should just go ahead and go through with it. I mean, uh, and as far as asking the tribal Indians, I think they got a really, that particular fella really... Um, hit all the things and, and, uh, and, and maybe, and, and it's their, it's their land and it would actually probably make opportunity for them to, if you wanted to come in and, and dredge and their own people, their own native people, many opportunities, uh, for the family to go out and have an outing and, and dredge and get a little gold. It's, it's quite fun. It's not something that, like the commercial dredges where they dredge channels. It's just totally the wrong idea there. And I think, I think people get mixed up on that. And so it's really a shame that, uh, like he said, an industry and now with gold prices going up, people like me and you and the family, Hey, we might go out and make a little bit of, uh, a gold there and, and just have a great time and be happy and, and not do any damage. Whatever rocks you move, they always get moved back with the summer runoff and the whole river's moved. Much more disturbance than we could ever do in a thousand years. <laughs> so that's all I got to say. And I hope you all just go ahead and streamline this and uh, go, go ahead and, uh, and, and, and uh, get a, get, let the NSDS people take care of, of just being notified. And like here in Colorado... Um, you know, I just checked in with the forestry. We don't even need a permit because, I mean, up the whole river, there's nobody even has any claims, and I'm the only one dredging, and I'm having a hard time getting there. I'm 64. <laughs> so, y'all, thank, thanks for letting me talk, and uh, um, good luck on this. Uh, people really need it, and a lot of families and miners make their living. Like me, I, it, it'll sub it's going to subsistence me and my friends in California who still do it. Um, they made $6,000 in, uh, in uh, last year by hand, but, um, they, w they would like to have an opportunity. We've lost a lot of our areas, uh, that you can even pan. So, um, this is something that it, it, it is, it is not fair for people and families to not be able to do it a total moratorium is wrong and we've been suffering for quite a few years so i'm asking that y'all just 
the duty permit process if you need to, or just get per, uh, uh, permission from the water, your local regional water board and notify the, the, the NSDS people. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Mr. Young. Appreciate your comments. Uh, I think that wraps up uh, public comment at this point. Uh, Mr. Wiles, unless anyone else has joined um, or otherwise indicated uh, that they would like to speak. No, at this point, the clerk hasn't received any more requests and it doesn't appear that anybody's joined us. Well, I really appreciate everyone's time today and comments and, and discussion. Um, you know, af after further uh, hearing further comment, I, I think it, I'll stick uh, mainly to my, my initial comments around uh, really wanting to see uh, the greater map mapping data out, um, that that's going to be uh, pretty important for everyone here, uh, all the stakeholders to better understand, and for us as well to understand uh, where exactly it is uh, prohibition and otherwise is being proposed. Uh, Mr. Bishop, do you have any uh, sort of thoughts on that or and or anything you may have heard that you would want to say so um it, it seems pretty apparent that um that there's a lot of concern on both sides about the accuracy of the maps um i would suggest that um that we commit to high resolution maps and um and narrative text that go with those um what that means practically is that i, I think we should extend the comment period um, indefinitely at this point until we can get those maps produced and put out and available. And then um, at that point, we'll um, put a close to the comment period after a, a sufficient time for people to look at it. Um, I, I don't have a date for that yet today. And um, I don't want to give people an impression that, um, that we can't meet at this moment. So my suggestion is that we um, send out a revised notice leaving the comment period open and um, and then as we get the maps prepared and publicized, we'll put out another notice that um, gives a 30-day or so comment period on that to close it out. Great, I think that's fair um, and appreciate that. You know, I don't want to necessarily commit to uh, a time here when we can get it out. Simply that we will. Um, you know, do want to be expeditious in that. Want to keep you know this conversation going. Uh, for folks, but really uh, make sure that we have the data out there. And so I'm I'm supportive of that. Of just uh, at this point leaving open ended the public comment period until the the um, the maps go out. I think maybe it's worth once those maps or data go out, maybe just a, a small uh, way to kind of I don't know. It can be a pre recorded even just uh, like how to use the data or you know whatever. Just kind of a workshop around whatever it is that we're releasing itself. Um, and um, not a policy discussion, I want to caution everyone, but a technical one around what it is, what tool that we're, we're um, releasing, and what are the layers in it, and how is it you know, connected back to the proposal, and you know how best for folks to really be used. So um, that's all I would say there. Uh, and uh, again, I appreciate everyone's good comments and look forward to the uh, more detailed written comments as well. Um, so that we can keep track of and do our best to do what we're always called to do, which is balance uh, these many competing uh, uh, needs and challenges uh, in the watershed, certainly. But I open it up to other board members at this point for further comment, um, thought, reflection, direction as well. Um, I, well, this is uh, Laurel. I would. Um you know, I just clarify, I think I had a lot of comments or, or questions earlier, but, um, you know, I, I think in addition to the mapping also, you know, that that will also give us time to further um, tribal consultation and work through um, those issues. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I think, you know, help clarifying, um, you know, how the maps can continue to evolve based on um you know new information and studies and um you know a public process with those uh 
to, uh, you know, and that, that may be through the five-year permit renewal, but it'd just be helpful to clarify what that process is and how that can be built in. So those are my main uh, questions, or not questions, but like continued um, areas of work that I would, I would love to follow. Great, thank you, board member. I, I just wanna thank everyone who commented today and just the wide variety of comments from you know, environmental stakeholders, um, from miners, and uh, your comments are really appreciated. And it's been very helpful for me. And I've been giving a lot of thought today um, as this hearing's gone on as to what my comments should be. And at this point, I think what I'll do is I'll just want to flag that um, the com some of the comments that resonated with me, and I, I just don't have enough information at this point, are when some of the miners discussed um, the fact that most of the mining activities are actually that are currently going on today that the miners would like to utilize aren't covered under this proposed permit uh, in terms of the type of equipment that they would use and the locations and and so that leads me to start to think you know it, in addition to all of the um, restricted areas and their preferred areas of the watersheds just aren't wouldn't be accessible under this permit so that leads me to think about the possibility that a lot of the miners would be compelled to then go to the regional boards and ask for then a site specific or site you know individual permit and so i, I think i would like some more information uh, going forward here and since we're extending the comment period i think we'll have a little more time to to do this just to think through what are those different um, techniques that miners might use what are the different risk levels involved um, do we have site specific data? Do we have technology specific data that could be just to help inform the breadth of this permit uh, that's being proposed? So I just want to say that th this is tough. You know, we have a long legacy here with historical mining issues. We have merc mercury in the watershed. Um, many of our watersheds, you know, like it or not, it's there. Um, any activity you know, whether it's caused by mother nature uh, through a storm event or whether it's caused from physical activities of, of doing work in the river uh, or stream are, are going to cause impacts. And, and we do need to be mindful of those and in protecting our aquatic life and other beneficial uses is um, paramount to the board. But um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't consider, you know, readily available data, um, consider, you know, other pathways and you know, as we're thinking through a statewide permit um, for an activity that has been essentially on, on a moratorium for quite some time now, um, I, I do want to understand how available whatever we end up adopting will be to that community that would take advantage of it um, relative to, you know, other, you know, individual requests that they might feel they need to take to the regional boards, because all of those are going to be ultimately work that either the state board or the regional boards will need to undertake. Um, it's additional work. You know, there were a lot of questions brought up today about enforceability uh, and how that would be uh, upheld with this permit. So I, you know, would like to know more about that. These are to me just as we move along with this process, but I felt I wanted to mention that today. So thank you. Thank you, board member. Vice chair, I think maybe you're you're the last, uh, it hasn't necessarily said anything, but if you, you don't need to as well. I just feel compelled to let folks know that um, um, I did um, take a break midway through today to attend a funeral. And so I will be um, following up with staff so that I um, get a better sense of some of the comments that uh, took place during the time in which I was at the funeral. And I look forward to uh, the public comments um, as well. Um, for me going in, the main concern that I had has been raised and identified, and that is the map. Uh, I had lots of questions about the map. Um, in um, my briefing um, uh, when I first saw it. And so I do appreciate the extended public comment period and Chair Esquivel, I really think that's a good idea to have a, um, a, a very limited scope um, meeting or stakeholder opportunity workshop, whatever we call it, to um, walk people through how the map um, 
uh, could be um, the, the updated map um, could be better understood and utilized. Great, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, any other last thoughts um, before we uh, wrap up here and I conclude the uh, the workshop? Okay, well, hearing none, uh, I, thank you again, everyone, for what has been a, a good day of, of comment and discussion here. Uh, you know, really appreciate that we are at the workshop point. Um, again, we are leaving the public comment period open at this point until we can get higher resolution maps out so we have that more definitive data uh, and discussion with folks out. And it sounds like it'll be an opportunity to further discuss a few other items that uh, fellow board members have, have brought up here. And so just uh, appreciate everyone's uh, good faith discussion and opportunity to help us understand uh, the lay of the land here. And uh, thank you for what I consider a successful workshop for that. Um, and uh, hearing uh, nothing further, Mr. Wiles, I'll just check in with you uh, if there's anything further I'm missing. Uh, but then otherwise, thank you as well and uh, everyone for their help in conducting today's uh, meeting. A successful one so uh, chair Esquivel no I don't think you've missed anything I think okay. uh, a motion to adjourn would be timely and then with that uh, we may adjourn and this workshop is brought to a close thank you everyone uh, see you in a couple of weeks for sure and I'm sure before that as well so thanks take care thanks